Welcome to Hot Chips 27. Tutorial 2. Makers from Hobbyists to Professionals. All right, uh, welcome to Maker's Tutorial uh, from Hobbyists to Professionals. Uh, I'm Christopher Nita, I'm an uh, adjunct professor at UC Davis and I helped organize the uh, tutorial. Uh, hopefully, can you get the slides up? There, there we go, okay. Uh, <laughs> So hopefully you'll enjoy the program we've uh, assembled for you. Uh, but uh, before I get to the speakers, I wanted to say a few short things. Uh, I think it's important to uh, ask why, why are we seeing an explosion of uh, makers projects happening now? Why didn't this happen 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, right? Well. In the past, you know, we had to deal with this. So I'm pretty sure there's some people that remember these, but for those who are too young to remember it, these are dip package UV erasable chips. And when we develop with uh, embedded systems in the past, we would actually have to, you know, we'd write our code, compile it, and then we'd program it using usually a parallel port programmer. If you don't know what a parallel port is, you may not know what, what these are either. It's, it's kind of what came before USB. Um, so uh, once you programmed it, you'd put the chip actually into your board and you'd test it, see if it worked. Inevitably it wouldn't, there would be a problem. And so you'd pull the chip back out and put it into a UV bath, basically. And the serious developers would have multiples of these chips, and usually by the time you changed your code, recompiled, and were ready to program the chip again, the one that had been in there longest was uh, usually erased. So you would keep doing this process over and over again until finally you got the system working the way you wanted. And then you'd put a little sticker over the window so that hopefully your program would stay on the chip. So not only was this really time consuming, but this could be expensive and therefore really prohibitive for hobbyists to just do embedded systems. Another thing I remember is that we always had to deal with multiple discrete chips, right? So you may have an embedded processor, maybe you were lucky enough to have RAM and some type of uh, programmable uh, non-volatile memory in it, uh, but all the rest of your peripherals usually were discrete chips. So you may have a separate UART and uh, ADC. And then you inevitably have to have some type of glue logic. So you would add in a CPLD or a PAL, right? So again, more complexity that the average hobbyist didn't want to deal with. Well, now because of Moore's law and the tremendous amount of transistors we have available, most system on chips are extremely powerful, especially when it comes to its peripherals. I mean, this is an example of the Zinc 7000 uh, microcontroller. It's hard to find a peripheral that's not already integrated on this. And then you have the FPGA fabric on top of that. So all of this integration and uh, shrinking of everything into a single package have uh, made it so that now makers are pretty much just limited by their own imaginations. So enough reminiscing about the past. Uh, so let's go on to today's agenda. 
So we'll start off with a talk from Pete Doctor. Uh, he's going to talk about the hobbyist side of makers and uh, give you an overview of the products that are available out there in case you do have a project, some idea you want to work on. You know, you might be able to uh, pick out something to start playing around with it on your own. Then uh, we'll have a talk about uh, some of the products that can actually spin all the way from hobbyists to professional products uh, from Venkat Metella and Salaja Durrani. Uh, they'll also be doing a demo of the Wisby board that we'll be uh, giving away, I think, 100 free boards uh, to the people that win the raffle. Uh, then we'll take a quick break and then after the break, Andreas Olofsson is going to give a tutorial on software-defined radio uh, using the Perella board. And that's actually one of the boards that I believe uses the zinc uh, chip on it. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, our final speaker will be uh, Brajesh uh, Bavzar uh, from ARM, who will talk about the trends of makers and how it's enabling the Internet of Things. So... I'd like to introduce uh, my first speaker. Uh, Pete Doctor is the Director of Engineering at SparkFun Electronics. He also uh, does uh, online video uh, <clears throat> uh, series on the uh, electrical engineering uh, uh, technologies called, uh, according to Pete, Pete Doctor. Hi, uh, my name is Pete Doctor. Uh, greetings from Colorado. All the stories are true. <laughs> Just saying. Um, I'm the director of engineering for Sparkfun Electronics. Uh, I've been there for about 10 years. So if any of you are familiar with Sparkfun, uh, the older, scuzzier products were probably all my designs. So back in the day when I was the engineering department, the tech support department, Customer service, I did the product photos, I did the product descriptions. Uh, that was pretty much all my stuff, so I'm sorry. Um, I do a little video thing on the side called According to Pete. Uh, if I'm fortunate, nobody here has actually seen that because I tend to butcher electrical engineering principles for entertainment. Um, people seem to dig it, though. That's, uh, that's a cool thing. Um, the reason I'm here today is to tell you about uh, uh, some of the things that are happening in, uh, in I don't want to say the maker thing. I'm not a big fan of the word maker. I'm not a big fan of marketing terms at all. Um, but the DIY community and uh, what, what people are doing there. Um, I'm going to talk about trends, but I want to be clear. Um, I'm not a sales guy. I'm not a marketing guy. I am an electrical engineer. and I. Uh, very, very much cut from the cloth of I like to play with electricity. So some of the things are, are definitely from a place of passion that I'm going to describe. Uh, and I'm not here to sell SparkFun products. Uh, and I'm going to reiterate that a few times. This is definitely from an engineer's perspective who enjoys what they do. So what I'm going to cover specifically I'll uh, give you a little uh, history of SparkFun to give you a little idea of like, how we make our decisions about products, um, where our motives lie, um, <laughs> what drives our market. More interesting than you might think. Probably not. Probably obvious. Um, and thus armed, um, you can decide if anything I've got to say is of any value. Uh, again, I'm not trying to sell stuff. I'm trying to impart the passion that is that we like to think is our market. Um, and it's expanded a lot since the early days, but we'll kind of talk about that. Uh, specifically, there are three main areas that I want to cover. One of them, uh, right, if you're going to build a project, you have, you have to have like a control system, right? So I'm going to talk about some microcontrollers. I'm going to talk about some single board computers that are popular um, or becoming popular in one case, perhaps, I hope. I'm uh, going to talk about uh, RF in general and IoT. Not a big fan of IoT. I, I, I get the idea. Everybody wants their stuff connected to the internet. That's obvious. Um, 
I don't like when I go to CES and as soon as I get there, they're like, IoT, you've got to know IoT, man. You know, I, I don't need to be marketed to. That's cool. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to talk about sensors, which, uh, right, you've got to talk to the real world. And so sensors are a very big piece of our business. Um, we have a lot more in the catalog, but those are, those are the three main areas that I think are going to be most interesting to you guys. So, who or what is SparkFun? Do you guys know who SparkFun is? A couple, maybe? You don't know anything. This is almost great. Um, so, what we do, right? Um, these are my words. We are a value-added retailer of electronic gadgetry that loves to teach, all right? So, so, one of the reasons why I feel like you can take me seriously is that we don't, we don't make the ASIC, we don't make the micro. We just, what we do is we take the things that we think are most interesting, most useful, and we make it easier to use. So we, um, we'll put it on a board, we'll, we'll, we'll make it a palatable um, platform from which to work, we'll break out a bunch of pins, and we'll wrap some code around it, some sample code. Usually it's gonna be Arduino, it might be Python, it might cater to you know, a Pi or, or a BeagleBone or one of those. Um, yeah, that's what, that's what we do. We make things easier to use. Um, a few of the areas that we, uh, we strike upon, uh, microcontrollers, as I said, single board computers, um, any and all sensors that we can find, right? Because everybody's always looking for like the new, cooler way to talk to the world or, or you know, interact with the world from their electronics. Uh, and so, huge category for us. Uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, cellular, right? IoT, you know how I feel about IoT. Um, and for, uh, we actually have our own free cloud server, uh, data.sparkfun.com, please check that out. Uh, robotics, we dabble. I wouldn't say that we're the best in the field, but we do enjoy robotics, we like to play with it. We are enamored with it from time to time. Um, so, you know, we poke at it. Uh, wearables. Uh, two years ago at CES, it was all wearables. You've got to know about wearables, man. Uh, specifically, uh, for us, we do a line of uh, sewable things uh, called LilyPad, which you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, so the idea is like it's a little badge or something that stitches onto your clothing, and you can use conductive thread to go around. Uh, it's big in educational spaces uh, for beginners and such. Inspirational electronics. Now this is where my passion's gonna come in. All right, you see the thing, you see the picture, right? Does anybody recognize what that is? Not a single hand goes up. Okay, what this is. Um, you remember the old TI calculators from like the 70s that had the little red digits, the tiny little displays? That is a bubble display, okay? Now one day, when, when we review products to see if we're gonna carry something, uh, somebody will bring an example into the engineering department because we're all nerds and we're all children and we are the ones that review the products that we're going to sell. And somebody brought that thing in and everybody's jaw dropped, including my own. It's like, I, I shut up and take my money. The thing is too cool. I don't even know what I'm going to do with it, but I need 10. And I bought 10. I've used one. But that's the inspiration, right? That's, that's the passion that I'm talking about. It's, it's just, some, you see a thing and you need to make something out of it. And that's a large part of the people that we serve. Um, additionally, all of our in-house products are open source, so you can go to GitHub and you can get uh, all of our documentation, all of our schematics, all of our production files, all of our code. No questions asked. You wanna go spin one? Be my guest. It's not a thing, go do it. Um, and about a zillion tutorials and videos. Um, we like to teach stuff. It's fun. Uh, that's how I got swindled into doing a uh, video series. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, now, how did we get to this place? So a long time ago, uh, I was actually uh, a technician before I became an electrical engineer. And when I hooked up with the founder, Nathan, um, we, we, there, there was a lot of conversation about how we wanted to proceed with this. And uh, I had been around the block with various silicon manufacturers about 
You know, hey, you know, we, we, if you want this part, you know, how many thousands are you going to sell? Oh, you got to sign an NDA before you can get the data sheet. Why? I d do you want me to work with your technology? Because I don't want to if you're going to make me work for it. I just, you know, um, really unwilling to pay for an IDE. So, and I, I love this example. Um, we would have, uh, again, I'm not going to point out any one manufacturer, but they would come in with their new $2 microcontroller and say, hey, check this out. This, it does X, it does Y, it does Z. It's the most amazing thing. And not only that, in quantities, you can get them for 57 cents. Really? That's awesome. How do you program it? Well, you program it with our programming package. And it's, uh, oh, it's limited to 8K? Really? And, and then they very sheepishly go, well, um, okay, well, if you want like the expanded unlimited version, that'll be $10,000 and, and such. And at that point, we're like, okay, we're, we're done here. We can't, sell, we can't sell your $2 micro if somebody's got to pay 10 grand for an IDE for the privilege of programming your part. So I'm actually quite proud to say that I think we were a little bit instrumental in turning that tide. Uh, most IDEs you can get for, I'll, okay, there, there are always going to be examples, but a lot of them now you can get for free. Uh, and I really dig that. Uh, we wanted to help others get out from under the thumb of the man. Okay, there's no man. I think I was up late and watching Black Dynamite, and that's where that line came from. Um, we wanted to make hard packages easier to work with, right? So our reasoning is that if something is, if, if hardware is hard, right? If, if somebody else is having difficulty, or if we're having difficulty using this, it stands to reason that other people are as well. Um, and not because we thought there was going to be a market for this, but we just, we had extras for our own projects. And we put them up on the storefront, and they started selling. And so things happened very easily in the beginning for us. Um, and again, we're driven by passion more than dollars. Uh, but I want to qualify that statement, right? Because back, back in the early days, it was a lot easier to make ends meet, okay? When you're four guys working out of a house, and I worked out of a bedroom for like a year, uh, it's, it's, it, money just came. Sales just came. We didn't even have to try. We took like analog devices, parts, and we put them on a little breakout board about yay big and, and post them up there, and orders came from all over the world because you couldn't get the stuff anywhere. Uh, these days, it's a little different. We've got like 140 employees. Um, we've got competitors, a lot more competitors. I mean, there were competitors back in the day, but now there's a lot more. Um, and we've got a new building that we're trying to pay for as well. So for as much as our audience depends on us to curate our catalog, uh, hitting home runs for us has become a lot more important. That said, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, no, I should tell you to say this too. Um, it puts us in a funny place, right? As I said, curation is a big part of the equation for our customers. Um, and because we need to make home runs, because we need the bigger scores, we find ourselves making deals with larger companies with bigger budgets for marketing and such. Um, and they come to us and they say, gosh, it would be really nice if you guys were to do this and do that. And we're like, well, that part kind of sucks. We don't want to do that with that part. Um, but they're usually pretty cool about it, uh, and we haven't had to compromise the ability to sell things that we have faith in yet. We're still a small company by a lot of reckoning, so there's, there's room for change. Um, and of course, you know, the people that we sell to, they just want the parts for cheap, they want it easy to use, uh, and they want their lives to be simple. And so nowadays, we're trying to strike this balance between we're going to make enough money to sustain the company and we're still going to be able to support the community that helped us grow to where we are. <sighs> so why should you trust me? Why does anything I say have any value at all? Um, because I don't represent any one person, uh, any one company. I mean, I represent SparkFun, but we do it for fun still. And I think, I, I feel really strongly that I can actually say that. Uh, my information comes from our own sales, it comes from all the hacker websites like Hackaday and portions of Reddit, uh, our own community forum, and uh, yeah, so let's, 
barrel on with this. Oh, brief interlude. This is my puppy dog. This is Commander Murfington. Okay, he's Merlin. Uh, he goes by a variety of names depending on how I have to coerce a child. But he's my interlude. Let's move on. First up, the AT ATSAM D21. This is the part that is on the new Arduino Zero. Everybody familiar with Arduino? That is a, okay, a few of you are willing to put up hands. That's, I don't know if I'm gratified by that or not, but let's, let's just talk. Um, specs of this thing, 32-bit uh, ARM, Cortex-M0 Plus running at 48 megahertz, bunch of program space, six COM ports that can act as USART, SPY, or I2C. So you can plug your junk into a lot of places and talk to it in a lot of different ways. 12-bit ADCs, 20 channels, up to 350 kilosamples per second, right? So that's like 20 channels all multiplexed through a single thing. So if you want 350 kilosamples, you get one channel. Uh, and you divide down as you add channels. Still pretty cool. 10-bit DAC. I like DACs. Not for any science reason, because DAC means noisemaker to me. That's the truth. I did not become an engineer to impress anyone. I became an engineer so I could inflict pain on my fellow human by making irritating sounds and stuff like that. So I love this. Um, DMA controller, so you get uh, fast data transfers between all your junk, USB cap sense, lots of potential for this part. Um, on the downside, which you don't really have to, 3.3-volt uh, only, and I say that because in the educational beginner spaces, it's still advantageous to have 5 volt parts. Um, but they're slowly moving over to that space. Uh, 7 milliamps per I.O. Now, I, I think I've been spoiled by like the 328s that are on all the older parts, like the Uno, uh, right? Because those will source or sync something on the order of 30 or 40 milliamps. And you can drive LEDs. You can drive an LED with 7 milliamps, too. Just that was bright. Um, and really, you throw down a transistor, you got drive, it ain't a thing, whatever. Um, the other thing, you can program it with Arduino, but you have to program it with Arduino. Now, the reason I say this is because I know that um, for really hardcore uh, coder people, uh, <laughs> which I am not particularly one of, um, the Arduino IDE has been something of a, mm, it's really not ready for prime time. Uh, for me, for my purposes, it's worked well enough, uh, and it's free. Uh, but uh, and for most beginners, it's fine. But you know, if you're one of those people, it's still going to be Arduino. Although they have been making a lot of strides in the last year, year and a half, two years. So I expect that to get better over time. Uh, the takeaway from this, of course, is that there's going to be a lot of zero knockoffs. We've got a couple on deck ourselves. Uh, I expect that to be a popular part. Uh, as well as, uh, on my little cue card here, the ATSAM W25, which is basically the same as the D21, just has Wi-Fi embedded in it. Uh, there's also an L, L21, which is a low power. So that one might actually find itself onto, uh, into our lily pad line into a wearable application because of the low power aspect. Um, yeah. Arduino, always going to be a thing. Single board computers, Edison, and question mark. All right, so let's talk about the Edison for a sec. Um, full disclosure, I haven't rung one of these out yet. Uh, I do have a couple of projects on deck. Uh, and these aren't work projects, right? Remember I talked about passion? I do all my own projects at home. Um, but uh, I've, I've got some things lined up that may benefit from one of these. Um, Running down the specs, uh, Atom dual core CPU running at 500 megahertz plus a quark micro for real time control running at 100 megahertz. Depending on who you ask, uh, you have uh, different levels of availability to control the, uh, the quark, right? If you ask Intel, be like, hey, sure, you can get it. It's all ready, it's all done. I talked to my people who have been working with it, and like, hmm. Eh, the community's bringing it along, but it's coming. It's coming. Um, four gig of flash, one gig of RAM, Wi-Fi and BLE built in. Runs Yocto and Debian, thanks to community support. Uh, programs with Arduino. Arduino. Uh, Eclipse and the Intel XDK. 
Uh, as I said, growing community. We have a lot of uh, a lot of people who are working to support this thing. And um, uh, lost my spot. We have a, uh, and, and uh, we're a um, lot of hardware support, right? So we did like we wrapped an ecosystem around this thing. We've got like somewhere between 10 and 15 different boards. They're called blocks. And, uh, and they, they support, as you see from the picture, fits underneath the Edison. Uh, and uh, yeah, those have been doing really, really well. Um, heavily targets IoT, right? So it's a single board computer, but there's, there's no video. You can't plug a monitor in. You can't plug a mouse in. You can't plug a keyboard in. It's, you know, but it's not meant to do that. It's meant for IoT and wearables. And the, the power consumption reflects that, right? So, you know, if you're running it off a single LiPo, you power this thing down, and it's down to like 13 milliwatts. So that's, you know, three or four milliamps. Not great. I mean, it's not an MSP430, but an MSP430 is not an Edison either. So that's, that's the way that goes. Um, now, this is worth, worth mentioning. This is an example of a large company with lots of money trying to push the market. Um, and this is nothing against Intel, right? As I said about SparkFun, we have to find newer and better ways to make ends meet, right? The, the, the little score isn't going to keep us fed anymore. We can't, we can't make our living off of breakout boards alone. So I'm not, they're doing what they got to do. They're trying to get into what is potentially a very huge market. Now that said, we still dig this part. This is, this is a fully fledged, single board computer, and we dug it from the start. Um, but looking at Intel and looking at their marketing capability and, and their willingness to put, put some effort behind marketing this thing is part of the equation that gets us on board. And the reason is because um, this is a really slim margin part. Okay, we, I, I can't remember what it retails for. I think we get it for like a buck less than that. So if we're going to make money off of this thing, I mean, besides, we just love it. Yes, we have the passion, but if we're not making any money, we're all getting new jobs tomorrow. So we had to wrap an ecosystem around it. Um, and of course, Intel has done a fairly decent job promoting this to that community. So it's paid off really well. They're, they're doing really, really well. Uh, I expect this one to have a fairly decent lifespan. It's still, I mean, looking at the sales numbers, they're seriously up and to the right. Everything's cool. Now that question mark. The Qualcomm Dragonboard 410C. Um, this is not a trend yet. Um, but let's talk about it. Uh, Snapdragon 410C quad core up to 1.2 megahertz. Uh, sorry, megahertz. <laughs> right. Uh, gigahertz per core. It's got Wi-Fi and BLE built in with integrated antennas, audio, video, all the stuff you want to expect from a Pi, you can get it here too, and it's faster. Uh, USB, I2C, SPY, all the usual suspects. Uh, and thanks to a lot of effort on their part, it'll run Android 5.1, Ubuntu of some flavor, I haven't heard yet exactly, uh, and Windows 10 IoT. Uh, and I'll revert back to that point in just a sec. But Pete, aren't single board computers somewhat ubiquitous these days? Why is this cool? Okay, in my opinion, y you can't get around without seeing a single board computer someplace. The, the market is fairly saturated by my reckoning. Um, you may have a different opinion. But why is this cool? Why do we think it's cool? Um, because first of all, it's got integrated GPS. That's different, right? I mean, you can add GPS to any of the other single board computers, but this one, Done. It's already done. Um, and maybe cellular. Now, I'm getting this off of their own product page, so I don't think I'm going to make anybody angry by giving this information up. There's a cell modem on the 410C. I don't know if that's ever going to see the light of day. Um, if they were to release the Dragon Board, um, and by the way, I don't know if I said this, uh, you can get it for like 75 bucks off of Arrow now, so about two times what a pie is. If they were to re release that thing with access to the cell modem today, I think it would be a very compelling board. Um, but the cellular functionality is tied up in lawyer land and IP land, and I don't know if it's ever going to come out. 
And honestly, in my own opinion, um, I'm, I'm sort of of the opinion that Wi-Fi is going to become a public utility before too very long, right? So the longer they hold out on access to that cell modem, less anybody's going to care. It ain't going to make any difference. Um, so hopefully they get that sorted and make it available. Uh, another reason we dig it is that it follows the Linaro 96 board open spec for single board computers. So as per the Edison, if we're going to make money off of this thing, because again, this is going to be a really slim margin part, we have to wrap an ecosystem around it. Um, ooh, 20 minutes, I better start blazing. Um, so this is, it's very attractive. If, if, if the standard gets adopted, uh, there's a lot of room for us to play and a lot of ways we can actually help the community. Then there's the Enigma factor. Now, they've also got parts, or they, got, they have boards for their 800 series parts, um, but those things are all like 500 bucks. Mortals are not going to buy these unless they're backed by a large company that says, here, here's the credit card, go buy what you need to buy. So this one's got the decimal in the right place. So there's a lot better chance that this will be a thing. And where I come from, when you tell somebody that you're working with a Qualcomm part, they go, really? How'd you get that? So we see some potential here. Somewhere between a microcontroller and uh, really an FPGA, the FreeSock board, uh, FreeSock 2. Um, this we did uh, in conjunction, we did, it was a collaboration betwe uh, between us and a guy named John Moeller and Cypress, who's behind that part. Uh, running down the specs, ARM Cortex M3, 80 megahertz, bunch of program space, 72 I.O., reassignable pins to any function. That's different for the people that we normally serve, so that's pretty cool. Um, four op amps, four comparators, so it does mixed signal, USB, CAN, CAP sense, 8-bit DAX, you know how I feel about DAX, 12-bit uh, ADCs, uh, programs uh, with pre PSOC Creator. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a sec, but as I say, free and clear, no limits. Thank you, Cypress, for listening. Um, and on and on. Why we like this part? Well, there's the analog aspect, right? That's, that has a lot of attraction. It does mixed signal. Reassignable pins. None of that exists where we live yet. That's pretty cool. Uh, the IDE, again, free and clear, lots of examples. Um, but it's a mixed bag, right? So we're looking for, when we put this board together, and you may recognize this is like uh, an Arduino mega-ish form factor, okay? We're looking for an off-ramp from beginner Arduino into something cooler, more capable, more satisfying, right? In a very embedded sort of fashion. Uh, and this is a good way to go. Uh, but that IDE is not Arduino. There is going to be a learning curve and whether or not I can make this board a successful board, as I think it should be, is going to depend on how well I can convince people to get past that IDE. But I'm not just trying to sell you parts. I have a project. This is one, uh, one of my projects. I've got a slew of them. So what you're looking at here <laughs> on my 2x4, uh, you see a stepper motor with a, a rotary encoder. And uh, yeah, so there's the rotary encoder. Uh, and the belt drive along there. There's a carriage that rides on some quarter-inch rails. What you don't see is the piece of nichrome wire that runs the length of that thing. So what this is ultimately going to do is play music, right? I'm going to attach a glass slide to the carriage, and it's going to go up and down the string, and I will strike the string in some fashion. I might even like make an ebo of some kind, if you know what that is. Um, and you also see down here, very naively placed, is an Arduino Pro Mini. <laughs> that is not going to have the bandwidth to make this happen. So I don't want to just make one of these. I want to make like 10 of them. And I want them to play Claire de Lune. It's a lofty goal, but that's, that's ultimately where I'm going. I don't know if I can get there, but I think the PSOC 2 is a fairly decent way to go forward. Lastly, more Arduino. Okay, this one's purely trend, all right? And I know these things aren't new and shiny tech, uh, but the fact of the matter is we sell a zillion of them. And why do we sell a zillion of them? Well, because they're cheap, they're robust, and they're freaking easy to use. I keep a stash of Pro Minis on my bench. I, I, if 
on that previous slide behind that two by four was a whole bunch of my other projects that use Pro Minis, right? And that's how Pro Mini got onto that two by four because I've used it for so many things and it works so well. But it's eight megahertz, it's 16 megahertz, it's eight bit, eight bits of fury. Well, yeah, there you go. So Arduino, those things are never gonna go away. And honestly, uh, oh, the red board on the lower side there, that's our version of the Uno, if you're familiar with that. That's a production stable version for educators because educators don't like when things change. Uh, and I swear to God, the sales of that thing are still up and to the right. And, and the Uno is down. So I'll let you figure that out. But the, pro, the, uh, the red board is doing really, really well. Moving on to the next category, Wi-Fi and IoT. Starting with the ESP8266 Wi-Fi module. You guys familiar with this thing? You really ought to be if you're not. Um, this thing is taking our community by storm. Um, we have other Wi-Fi vendors emailing saying, hey, how come our stuff isn't selling so well anymore? Well, it's because there's this new thing out there that's community driven, and it's like a fraction of what you guys are charging us for your parts. And they don't like to hear that, I can tell you. Um, the specs, 1.8 to 3.3 volts, up to a 300 milliamp draw, uh, which, you know, down a couple lines, plus 20.5 dBm. So this thing's got some pretty decent range capability. Um, excuse me, 50 ohm output. All the RF is contained, but if you look closely, there's um, at least a couple of components in the RF path, so eh, coupling cap, whatever, it's fine. Um, you can use it as a Wi-Fi bridge because the stack is internal to the part. Uh, less than 10 microamps in power down, so it'll find its way into a lot of uh, battery applications. And again, community driven. That module on the top there, sub five bucks. Uh, I'm really sorry, ours sells for seven. Sorry about that. Uh, like I said, we gotta make a buck here or there. We're just not gonna be able to stay in business. And they do sell very, very well. Uh, on the bottom there, is um, the thing, right? You've, the, I, I hate this. The marketing phrase is, when you've heard of the Internet of Things, this is the thing. Ah, really sorry. Uh, anyway, um, that's our spin on the ESP, ESP8266. Uh, we broke out more of the I.O. We've done a bunch of tutorials, and it's got a shiny red PCB. Everybody loves red PCBs, man. Um, we may ultimately seek FCC for this. Um, Remains to be seen. We're still kind of batting it around. Um, and it works very well in conjunction with FANT, which is short for Elephant. I don't know how it got this name, but it's our, fraud, our, 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 fraud, our cloud, a free cloud server uh, where users can post their hamster wheel data. I was going to do this once upon a time. I never did. Um, but that's the thing. Uh, that got released a few months ago, and sales of both of these things are really nuts. Uh, the community is back behind them, and that is a trend. Okay, uh, particle, formerly Spark, uh, the photon, P0 and P1 modules. Uh, in the picture, what you see, this is the P0 module up here. Uh, the, P the P1 is on the board here that it's in uh, the uh, Arduino Uno, Uno form factor. Um, Run down the specs. You know, this is this is getting fairly boring, isn't it? The specs. It's got an arm. <laughs> it runs a Cortex M3. It's 120 megahertz in this case. Uh, Wi-Fi courtesy of Broadcom. One meg of flash. Uh, 128k of RAM. Mixed signal GPIO. 18 of them. This one's already certified, so they're looking for the big score, right? Um, you get access to the Particle Cloud service and their free IDE and over-the-air code updates. Give it a big, I don't want to screw with this too much factor, okay? That very much appeals to our customers. They want to get, they, I, I got a project, I got an idea, I need to get this done. And that's, that's where they're going with this. And then there's the P1, which is on the bottom. Um, and the only reason we did that was to, uh, you know, make it easier to use like all of the Arduino ecosystem that's existing currently. How are we doing? 14 and 12 minutes. Let's see. 
So, uh, you know what? I'm going to skip this one. These guys haven't been talking to us very much recently. We're still waiting for samples from RF Digital. Uh, they, this is this, the Symbly RFD 77101 module is a very similar module to the Photon stuff, except it's BLE. So they've got a cloud service. They've got over-the-air code uh, updates, a, a very cool module. We've got a bunch of hardware waiting on deck. We're waiting for samples. And they haven't been responsive in the past couple of days. So let's skip that one. Rounding out the RF uh, arena, the Nordic NRF51822, ARM Cortex, blah, 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 31 GPIO, Red Bear Labs and Embed are all over this thing already. Um, so we're probably not going to pick this up. But like I said, you can trust what I'm saying. This is a cool part, and I like Red Bear Labs stuff. Uh, we actually just uh, hooked up with them, and we're going to sell their hardware. Um, so this one is it's, it's less money up front, but it's going to be more effort to integrate. So you know, that's part of the equation that kept us out of doing anything with the NRF chip. Uh, then there's Cypress again. Cypress has a couple of parts, and I've already admitted to we've partnered with Cypress on some stuff, so we've already had to get over the IDE learning curve. So now that we're over that, we're looking at the other parts going, oh, that's kind of cool. Look at that. So there's the PSOC 4 BLE, right? So it's just like the, the other PSOC 4. It just got BLE embedded in it. Uh, M0, 48 megahertz, program space, 12-bit ADC, mixed signal, cap sense. Uh, you've heard it all before. Um, and then there's the EZ BLE PROC module. I don't know what PROC stands for. Uh, very similar specs as it should be, but it's stripped down, right? So I, I took a seminar uh, for this a few weeks back, uh, and it's a little tiny module about really itty bitty. Uh, got all the certifications. So again, big company looking for the big score, coming to us because they're trying to get the market seated. And uh, yeah, oh, that IDE, right? Same thing. If I can. If I can rig it so that people can get over the learning curve, I think there's a really good place for those parts. We haven't committed to these yet. There's potential. It's all going to depend on how well we can educate people around the Cypress IDE. Last category, and I've split this up into not, not that uh, three, three areas, um, starting with um, what is my thing up to? So I'm going to stick to like IMUs, right? And the two big players here, um, sales-wise and community-wise, are the LSM9 DS0, which is an ST part, and the MPU9150, 9250. Both of these companies are migrating to the second part numbers there. Um, and they're both uh, nine off MPUs. Now, when I first made this slide, right, this was not meant to be a final slide. Chris, thank you for doing that. <laughs> um, and I was getting down all the specs, because I couldn't, I, I was not sure, like, why, why does one sell more than the other? So if you look at the specs, they both do about the same amount of acceleration, both the same ranges of uh, gyroscopic, um, and of course, uh, uh, the, the magneto, the magnetic sensing is, is identical as well. Fun fact at the bottom, one Tesla equals 10,000 Gauss. There you are. Um, now, the, uh, the InventSense part, MPU9150, actually sells about three to every two of the ST part. Now, why is that? Um, part of it is community. I think uh, the InventSense part hit the community earlier, and so they got in, and, and all, the, you know, all the Arduino and Pi people got behind it. Um, also, the MPU9192950 has algorithms. Now, the last time I checked, not a whole lot of people had real access to what the algorithms were, but the whole idea is like all of the position reporting is off, or all, figuring out the actual position uh, is offloaded to the part itself. Um, I've got to assume that they've achieved some of that at this point uh, because uh, it's export controlled. So that's gonna, that, that, you would think that would hurt our sales a little bit, but it doesn't. These things sell a lot. Um, and because the two parts are very similar, there has been some litigation between the companies. Uh, I was actually called about three years ago to give deposition on that particular case. I have no idea where it's at now. Both of the parts sell pretty well, though. Um, and that's what most people are using. Um, now, you, uh, it's worth a mention at this point, ooh, seven minutes. <laughs> I got a blaze. 
Uh, but it's worth mentioning, right, when we started out, there were individual axes of accelerometers and gyros, and then they mixed two axes, and then they got all three of them, and then they mixed that together. It's, it's obvious. It's integration, right? And now they're pretty soon there's going to be an M0 on this, running at 120 megahertz with 128K of flash. It's all going to be there. A couple years yet. Um, followed by what is the world doing around my thing? So weather sensors. Uh, the big ones for us that are selling currently, uh, the Bosch BMP 180 barometric pressure sensor, we make that on a breakout board for 10 bucks. The HTU 21D from Measurement Specialties, that one's 15. And the Max Detect RH T03, which is on a breakout for 10 bucks. These things have been really popular and they're selling really well. Um, and then the new one coming out, well, it's already available. Uh, some of our competitors have it. Adafruit's got it if you don't want to wait for ours. Um, the Bosch BME 280, pressure, humidity, and temp. There it is again. Throw an M0 down, and what do you got? Um, so those are all very popular. Uh, and then the other thing that's really popular uh, is our weather shield, right? It's a little different. It's got the HTU21D. It's also got the Freescale MPL3115 pressure sensor which supposedly is able to spit out altitude readings. Uh, I don't think it actually does that. Uh, and the ALS PT19 light sensor, which is from Everlight, there. Um, now those are older parts. We will spin a new version of this, this shield. And of course, it is in the shield form factor because there are so many Arduinos. It's been very popular. Educators love this thing. We will spin a new one based on new sensors before too long. Uh, but the whole education thing sort of throws a monkey wrench in it because, like I said, regarding the redboard, they don't like when you change things, right? They don't like when, or when they have to reorganize their curriculum. There's probably a zillion teachers in this audience. You all know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but we will spin a new one. We'll probably run it alongside of this one for some time until the educators start to migrate to the new technology. Uh, and... Last, new and weirder ways to talk to our things. Starting with the ZX distance and gesture sensor. So this was a collaboration we did with uh, uh, XYZ Interactive. 3.3 um, to 5 volts, runs I2C or UART. Uh, it'll give you um, six inches of X, right? So if you picture the sensor flat on the ground, or on the ground, on, the, on a table, right? You can get about six inches that way and about 10 inches that way. So you got a little bit of gesture action that you can get there. Um, and in fact, our demo project was uh, a guy did like a Pong table with uh, uh, dot displays and you just hold your hand over it. You can control where the thing goes. And that was kind of cool. People dug that. Um, also, uh, the VL, this is an ST part? Yeah, ST. Uh, the VL6180, time of flight distance sensor, right? So it's, it measures distance by means of a very accurate clock. And it's just measuring, you know, I cut it out then, it comes back there, that's my distance based on the speed of light. Um, about 10, in, uh, 10 inches, 10 centimeters uh, of, of distance that you can get from it. Gesture, eh, with, with one axis, uh, well, whatever. Okay, it's a marketing thing, I get it. Um, now, the form factor, worth mentioning here, are you guys familiar with uh, the sharp sensors that are, have been in robotics for like years and years and years? Um, they've been saying these parts are EOL for 10 years now, and we can still get them. So I don't know when they're going to disappear, but when they do, we're ready, because that is in the form factor of the sharp sensors. So that'll mount exactly where the other ones did. Um, and the last thing here is the LiDAR light. This is from a company called Pulse Light. I love these guys. And that part is really, really cool. And as a, it's export controlled because it's so cool. Uh, we sat outside at Maker Fair San Mateo about three years ago and they gave me a demo in broad daylight pointing it at a building way the bejesus over there. And it was, it was like 30 meters away and the reading was just rock solid. Um, I'm really impressed with this thing. Uh, but it is expensive. That guy is 115 bucks, which, you know, again, if you're working for a huge company, that ain't a thing. But if you're a little guy like me, I just need a part. I don't want to, 115 bucks will buy me a lot of beer. 
I don't think I want to pay for this. So, so um, yeah, export controlled. Um, getting very close to wrapping here as I have two minutes. The Intel Curie has not been released, the shrinking of everything. So as you see, as I have illustrated, everything, more functionality, and, and our customers are getting accustomed to that sort of thing, and they're expecting that sort of thing. Uh, the Curie is about the size of your thumbnail, right? 32-bit uh, Quark, a whole bunch of program space, DSP, BLE, 6 off, coin cell, it'll wash your car, it'll mow your lawns, it'll track down your ex-lovers. Not yet, uh, but one day, one day it will. Ultimately, all things will become one thing that does all things, right? So as, as I've illustrated with the sensors and stuff, and, and, and I'm sure those will get cheaper, but if they make a zillion curies, and they get the price down to about a buck, why would you bother trying to integrate a whole bunch of other junk when you can buy this one thing and it'll do anything you want? It'll, you can pull it out of one project and put it in another and reprogram it, and, and that's the end of that. Um, so that's, that's the big trend, right? And I suppose that's obvious to this crowd. Um, but it's, it, 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 it gives me pause looking at the customers that we've served in the last 10 years and how they've come along and you know, how we've helped to shape what's coming and they've helped to shape what's coming. And pretty soon, they're gonna give up on stuff like single axes, uh, single axis accelerometers and gyros. Why bother? Um, I still like getting my analog devices parts, but they're gonna be less and less popular as time goes on. And stuff like this is gonna be nuts. With that, um, <laughs> the world is going to hell at a hand basket and you shall invest in tinfoil. This is my son, Ethan, in forced labor camp in my garage. He's tinning some wires for me uh, so I can put up a light fixture over my project space. Um, I wonder, he's already, he's already of the opinion he's gonna be a, a video game programmer. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, but with that, Thank you for having me. I hope it was entertaining. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions? Not a oh, one. Well, <laughs> I, I have a question. So uh, one of the things I always noticed when I was doing embedded systems was that there seemed to be a gap in uh, the parts of what peripherals you could get integrated together. Um, so uh, if I wanted USB or Ethernet or something, I usually couldn't get CAN on the same uh, right. part. Yeah. And uh, do you see that there's any peripherals or anything that haven't been integrated together yet? Like that there is some divide between this deeply embedded systems versus you know, more of the single board computer. So is there anything that I see that hasn't been integrated? Yeah, or that, there, that, that there's some gap between and they haven't bridged those yet. Not really. I mean, it's, it's the, like I say, the, the, it's, it's, they're trying to integrate everything at this point, right? And, and I'm out of ideas. I mean, they've pretty much integrated everything. I, I mean, okay, the Curie is lacking a few things, but not much. It'll do, it'll do a lot of stuff. And if they can get, you know, I mean, it's already battery operated. It's already got a six off on it. It's got all the communication. How much more do you need? Yeah, okay. So, oh, we have a question? Yes, uh, Nathan Brookwood, Inside 64. You mentioned when you were talking about Edison that it, Intel, you, I think you're charging $78 and Intel, you're, which is a dollar more than you pay Intel. And so you have to wrap <laughs> an ecosystem around it. So my question is, how do you make money on the ecosystem wrapped around Edison? Oh, well, we can get margin on that stuff. We make that stuff, right? So those are all the components that we can get margin on from, from our distributors, all right? You buy a, a reel of a 3,000 of something and, you know, price goes down. So we, we are getting margin on all of those things. Um, now, when we bundle that with an Edison, that goes down, but you know, we're still, we're still making out well enough that we can support the Edison. So it's other components that people need in order to make Edison yes, work? Yes, absolutely. It's 
It's not software or something like that because that's all open source, right? No, but, uh, qualified but, uh, the, software, uh, the software and the tutorials are a huge part of, of, the, of the value added equation. Um, if we did not do that, we wouldn't have nearly the sales that we do. And do you charge for the software and tutorials? Nope. So it's value added, but not dollars charged. Correct. Great, thank you. That's about it. Well, uh, can we thank uh, uh, Pete for coming to talk? And <laughs> thank you. We'll move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Venkat Matella. Uh, he's the CEO uh, of Red Pine Signals. Uh, he's been in the industry for over 30 years and holds uh, 11 patents. Uh, also, uh, Salaja Durrani uh, is an engineering manager at uh, Red Pine Signals who will be doing uh, demonstrations. Uh, she's uh, been with Red Pine Signals for 13 years, and she holds 13 patents, so it's a pretty good uh, <laughs> rate. So, Ben Kat? Good, after, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Venkat. I am the founder and CEO of the company. And I'm still an engineer, so please fl uh, feel free to ask any questions uh, at the end of the uh, presentation. So I'm representing, of course, the uh, Red Pine Signals. It's a 14-year-old uh, wireless technology company. And uh, we have started the company in 2001 with a focus of uh, creating a convergent silicon. And since then, we have uh, been working in putting all the uh, wireless protocols on the same die. After 14 years, we have managed to put five of them. And when we started, it was nine. And a couple of, couple of them even died during the course of 14 years. The company is a wireless uh, chipset company. And uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, de device development challenges and the uh, solutions, how uh, they're emerging in the market space. My agenda for today is uh, to show the opportunity that exists in the IoT space. As you may have heard uh, these days, these terms IoT and uh, cloud, these things are uh, talked everywhere. In fact, I was briefing an uh, editor recently, and in fact, he requested me not to use those two uh, words. So I'm very uh, aware of what has been going on in this space. And we have used, uh, we have spent close to two years in just developing this platform that I'll be talking about it today as part of the solutions for the existing uh, challenges in IoT device maker community. I will talk about the opportunity that exists. And uh, to go after that opportunity, what are the challenges that are, uh, uh, these developers are facing today? And how do we solve them? And a solution for that in the form of a VSB platform, that's where I will be spending most of the time. And there's a very unique uh, design approach we have taken in VSB platform that's called product synthesis. And I'll be elaborating that uh, a little bit more on that. And at the uh, later part of my presentation, we have uh, Shailaja, my colleague. Uh, she would be uh, showing the demonstration of uh, uh, certain applications which are not possible so far. So these are not like uh, whatever we see today in the market. There are something closer to 200 IoT platforms that exist today. So this is not like something uh, you, know, you can uh, uh, just type for the purpose of entertainment or some control and monitor. So whatever I'm talking about, there are a lot of technical aspects. Again, uh, they would be uh, addressed with the WSB platform, majority of them. And some of them are very complex, so they would take some more years to uh, address. So you would see that thing while I talk about, but uh, you know, I'll be really, uh, for me, at the end of this, uh, I want to really learn some new questions or difficult things which I can work on going forward. So that would be my agenda for today. So the uh, opportunity for IoT. So you, we all know about the, how the mobile smartphone market emerged. So I want to give an analogy to that one so that we can understand the challenges that exist in IoT space uh, compared to what we are all used to. So if you take a mobile phone, it is catering for people. 
So that means basically uh, in anywhere in the world, people have certain needs. So whether it's a pleasure or uh, increasing the productivity. And if you look at the number of uh, devices to cater to that market, it's only a smart four. Whether you have a more features, less features, it's pretty much uh, you know, one set of functionality. You can be more, more pleasure or more productivity, but they're not like you have 100 different type of applications or one, 100 different type of customers, you have to meet their requirements. And of course, there's a huge market size, almost 5 billion uh, uh, number of smartphones per year. And it took a lot of years, decades, before we came here. But if you take the IoT space, we say that in five years, next five years, it'll be 50 billion. That means you know, almost five times, uh, 10 times more than that, and we did not take 50 years to come here. So there's orders of magnitude complexity when it becomes the uh, uh, volume. But at the same time, more than the volume, that the problem that we have is not, hum it's not uh, designed for only uh, human beings. It's not designed for people. You're connecting things to things, things to people. And uh, it is also not for one particular custom uh, a company. It's a different market segments, tens of thousands of devices, and multiple market segments, the problem is totally different. That means anything that we have known so far in terms of design styles, the integration, the software models, they're not applicable here because somebody is uh, going to be using uh, 10,000 per year, a thermostat design, and that kind of model nobody has seen. It's not like one, one million chips per day, what we are used to. I'm a chip designer for 32 years. So this market is different. So the char characteristics of this market is inch deep, mile wide. And everything today you hear, all the solutions, all the challenges, they're all connected with this. This word that you need to, the sentence or whatever you want to take it from this meeting, from this conference is that inch deep, mile wide. That means that basically validates what kind of problems this particular market segment presents. That means you are not going to have a lot of volume that's given. If the, the best volume you could have is probably in the wearable side. Whereas you go into other markets, they'll be very, very small, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of units per year. And it's going to be very wide. That means people are going to be uh, uh, doing very t type of things with the IoT space. That means this is going to add a lot of challenges uh, going forward. And of course, the end of the day, everything is done here. Like in, I said in the mobile phone, you have the uh, either personal pleasure or productivity increase. Here it's always solving problems, business problems, or increasing the business efficiency. Those are the two things that have to be met, any solution that you provide. And that's the only reason somebody is going to pay for your platform, somebody is going to pay for your software, your hardware. So that's basically the big opportunity. Of course, we hear the numbers 50 billion in uh, 2020, and everybody wants to have a bigger number, and that's very nice for all of us because we can imagine that number. It keeps us motivated. And somebody says even trillion sensors. Those are all good things. We, we don't have to really uh, belittle those things. They're very nice things to uh, know about those numbers. And that's opportunity in IoT. So if you look at the challenges, I've listed a bunch of them. Again, a lot of those things look very familiar. And it's not just because I'm listing all of them as a features. Challenges are something that is not difficult to solve. They're not optimal. That means basically everything that I've written there, everybody would be thinking that what is a big deal? You can have multiple wireless protocols. You can buy three or four boards from different vendors and put them together. It's not that one. It's already known. IoT is nothing is known. Nothing is difficult in IoT. Everything in IoT is connected with efficiency. That means even if it was happening before, can you do it more efficiently? Can you solve a new problem in that space? So one of the things that we consider the big challenge in the IoT is the current solutions. Again, please remember always, it's an inch deep, mile wide. That means nobody is going to place an order for 1 million units for anything in IoT space. In this inch deep, mile wide market, does it support a solution creation from multiple vendors? That means you go and get a chipset from one vendor, and you go and get a module from another vendor, and you get some the tiny cloud software from some other vendor, and you write your own business logic, and you get the board design from somebody, and like someone said in the previous one, you know, tools and other things, they matter. So it's basically getting a solution creation from different vendors is one of the biggest challenges in the IoT space, because the volumes do not justify that. The second one is, of course, the multi-protocol wireless, and this is where we, we excel, because last 14 years, we have been, we have been designing trying to put all these wireless protocols, including the power amplifier, the R-bomb, everything on the CMOS die. And uh, we've managed to put five of them today. And it is a very, very challenging thing in the IoT space. This is one of the biggest challenges is that uh, how do you get to a price point of uh, meeting all these diversified applications? All those applications do not work with only one wireless technology. We would love to work, it, work with only Wi-Fi, and I think it will converge at some time. But today, you do have a need for a particular legacy equipment. 
with a uh, Zigbee protocol, and we need to communicate to that. And something else, we would be using a Bluetooth LE to take a health uh, monitoring device or a Bluetooth for a regular smartphone. Wi-Fi will be always there for network. So that means there is a scenario later on, I have a slide to show a generic use case scenario where multiple wireless protocols are needed. It's not something that we should not trivialize. It is needed. When you need them, then you would be assuming, let's get a, someone showed in the previous one, very nice slide where yeah, there's a cost is coming down for this Wi-Fi module for $5 and a Bluetooth module for $3 and a Zigbee for $2, something else for a $1. But by the time you add up, it's over uh, $10. And we think that the market has to be much, much smaller, order of orders of magnitude. That means it has to be in the order of a $1 with multiple wireless protocols. And in the whole world, there are very few people can do it, even if you give them infinite money. There's a real challenges in the chip design. And when you put all these wireless protocols together, then you also have a challenge of coexistence, because all these wireless protocols are working in a particular spectrum. And right now, we are happy because we are putting one board here, other board here. Somebody runs a nice program, control and monitor, and we declare success. I consider all this entertainment as just a pleasure thing. By the time you really make a real production device, it has to be meeting the right price point. It is a lot of challenge there in the multi-protocol wireless. Another one, of course, is the design tools. For a customer who is going to make 10,000 units or devices per year, and you have to play for, uh, pay for a PCB design to the initial prototype, and then you have to do the uh, integration of your software, and then basically go to the production. There's a lot of uh, uh, cost is involved in buying the tools and developing the uh, device, and uh, the cost becomes significant just because your volumes are not millions. If the volumes are millions, these costs are uh, insignificant. And of course, the uh, uh, remote device management. This is very important because these terms looks very familiar because the reason I put all of them, they're not something that difficult to solve. They're not done optimally. What that basically means is people have been using uh, remote device management in the networking world. Everybody mastered it. There's nothing to know. Very sophisticated stuff is there. However, in the networking business, there's a lot of money. Somebody there's a systems engineer. You have a yearly maintenance fee you pay, and it's nothing is uh, difficult to solve. But in IoT, as I mentioned earlier, there's nothing new. People have solved, but can you do it optimally? That means somebody is using a 5,000 units of some gadget, and something has to be diagnosed, some firmware has to be burnt into. There's no support engineer. In fact, I always tell my engineers, if there's a support call, we already lost money on that, because the volumes are so small. So that means basically, how do you design the new devices with the remote diagnostics, remote support, very cost effectively? So these are all the challenges that we have today in the IoT device making community. And how do we solve them? And here is the place where we spent two years in creating this. And our experience of creating uh, this particular device comes from supporting over 3,000 customers from, uh, since 2008. That's when we basically started selling our Wi-Fi uh, modules based on our own silicon after seven years of R&D. So companies 14 years of uh, expertise in wireless and six years of expertise in creating uh, uh, solutions along with customers, we have taken all the feedback, and that's what we created this platform. So this platform is not something that, you know, a, putting a bigger board to a smaller size and calling it IoT platform just because some cloud happens to run on that. Those are nothing new. Those are all basically everybody can do. There's nothing to uh, really uh, uh, talk about that. We need to spend some time. People can do it. So what is the special about this platform? If you look at the platform, it's a hardware. There are tools. Again, tools means efficiency, that I want to make it faster, make it low cost. And of course, the cloud part of it is where you can put your business logic. So when it comes to the hardware, we had to take care of, first thing is that, again, as I mentioned, that my real uh, value proposition is the single source solution. That means when your volume goes up, when you start off with a module, when your volume goes up, goes, goes up you can move to a chipset-based design. That's the transition that we provide when I say single source solution. And also, we have the entire environment where you can create a device working with one vendor. And this device, when I say this is not a device of a prototype, this is a device with FCC certified wireless MCU, the module, and the uh, security that is enabled inside this platform where you could provide the uh, device authentication for non-cloning, as well as uh, software hardware binding. So all these features are available on this particular uh, uh, board. It's a multi-protocol wireless, Wi-Fi, dual band, again, 5 gigahertz and 2.4, Bluetooth Classic, Bluetooth Low Energy, Zigbee, and MCU with one megabyte flash, all inside that module, which is FCC, ICCE, SRRC, Telec, it's certified all over for all the regions of the world. 
And then what happens is that you want to really create certain applications easily because we want to like previous uh, uh, presenter I really like because we are teaching is very important. People have to be in knowing how to design so that we can really make a devices. And in that case, we try to put certain sensors on the board. I do not believe with that particular couple of sensors we have on the board, you can create applications for all the markets. But I still wanted to keep certain sensors so that people can get uh, going faster. So we have partnered with MQ, the uh, motion sensor uh, uh, company, where we have ultra low power accelerometer and higher performance accelerometer, magnetometer, iGyro. Both those uh, sensors are on our platform along with IR sensors. So why, why do we keep both of them? The reason is the most important aspect of this announcement, uh, we, we announced the product a few days ago, is the, something called a product synthesis. Because as I mentioned earlier, IoT is not really technically challenging. That means you know, it doesn't look very complex. Because it is being used by uh, uh, developers, they might not be the you know, hundreds of thousands of people. They might not be the most savvy in the networking or wireless. But nevertheless, all of them combined, that makes that 50 billion. So we have to be more uh, smarter to create a solution for this particular community. So I came up with a concept we disclosed and patented this called uh, product synthesis. Because a developer can specify what he wants. If he says it's a battery powered device, then I know what are the things I need to take care. And he says what sensors he can pull down from the uh, tool, it's called uh, WSB Workbench. And he can take the uh, uh, features that he needs from the workbench, uh, a particular sensor he can pick up and uh, specify the parameters, wireless protocol, and you push a button, and we expect to create a product out of it based on whatever application he has created using our tool bench and the whatever the off-the-shelf microcontroller programs and the cloud, which is part of our WSB cloud. So that is the concept of the product synthesis. And how do we create a product just with this whatever th tools I mentioned? Those uh, three sensors that I mentioned, they are obviously not enough. So we studied all the segments of the IoT space, market segments and identified what are the various common denominator blocks are. We came up to 44, this is over, the, over a year time frame. And we, are, we came up with an interface on our platform called WSB Thing, because for IoT, Internet of Things, WSB Thing interface. And you will see that black thing that is a WSB Thing interface along with the side pins. So WSB Thing interface is the one which enables you to use our uh, set of library components we have, which we call it Thing Boards and we already studied all the market segments, it's very likely that it will be your application can be met using the thing boards that we already have in our library. So the uh, user, the development flow is microcontroller development, use the regular tools what you have. We also have a free tool, uh, CoIDE, but you can always use whatever you are familiar with, you know, Kyle IAR tools. You would see in our announcement, uh, you know, uh, 19th, when we made this product announcement, you'll see the support from some of the tool vendors. But the WSB workbench is the one, as I mentioned, everything is already solved in the microcontroller world as far as debugging things are concerned at the microcontroller uh, program level. However, when they, right now when we talk about IoT and cloud, your packets are going outside your microcontroller domain to the cloud, and nobody knows how to debug them. In a sense, it takes a lot of time. So that's where we came up with a concept called enhanced debugger. It's IoT debugger. It connects to the existing tool chain, but it helps you debug your program at a higher layer. The next one is people, when they design a low power designs, you need to really measure what would be your battery capacity of the end product is. And uh, the general trend is that you, know, you can estimate it or you can uh, uh, design a board and you run your final software on that and figure out whether it's matching or not. So what we have done here is in the part of the WSB workbench, we have a power designer tool. The uh, application that you are developing using the WSB thing boards and your own microcontroller end application you push a button with our power uh, designer, it exactly shows you whatever that particular application running on real hardware based on the stacking of the WSB thing boards. And that's how we came up with this concept called the uh, IoT power designer tool as part of the WSB workbench. So we have a hardware platform which supports the sensors, microcontroller, flash, and all the wireless on the same tiny 50 millimeters by 23 millimeters. You will be getting, I think you know, most of you guys will be getting these platforms today and the tool chain that will help you in enhancing the design and reducing the time. And we have our own cloud, of course. So in the single source solution, all the wireless protocols, all the thing, plat load, uh, thing boards and embedded firmware to connect to very popular uh, uh, web services. I'll talk about that as part of the demo as well as the next slide. That what, that's what is our uh, single source solution means. And this is the one which is for multi-protocol wireless. I mentioned that this is very important. 
and I also added to the top right in terms of to show what is the real challenge in the IoT when people talk about uh, you know cloud-based or IoT. These words are used so popularly, but uh, multi-protocol wireless is very critical in the IoT space. If you ever have to realize that number 50 billion is not going to happen with uh, you know one simple wireless, some company can do in the last three four years. After 14 years, we barely came to learn a few things. It takes that much. And there used to be 97 companies in 2001. They're less than 10. And uh, when I say that we have ca captured these five wireless protocols on the same die, and it so happens that uh, we, were the, we are the first one to have the IoT uh, single chip. That's called M2M combo. We have the Zigbee, dual band Wi-Fi, Bluetooth Classic, and uh, Bluetooth Low Energy. And here is an exam example of a lock. You might have heard about locks being controlled with the wireless. So when a uh, uh, user goes close to a lock, the Bluetooth LE comes up, and it is basically credentials are passed to the lock. Lock has to validate those credentials in enterprise security in the radius server. That means the Wi-Fi has to work with enterprise security. And certain large business logic is put in the cloud. So this particular uh, Wi-Fi module or the convergence module inside the lock, it needs to communicate to the cloud with SSL. And all these things have to happen inside the module. And if the user is not the right one, you might want to alert a system, some alarm system. It could be running on a Zigbee. So this is not a very corner case scenario. This is a very, very huge, uh, typical scenario of a Wi-Fi, Bluetooth working very uh, in conjunction. But the more than the, just the hardware side, the embedded software that has to work for SSL as well as the uh, enterprise security, they're very, they have to be all in this tiny device. And uh, when somebody says 50 billion, just take that 50 billion, you multiply with that whatever the lowest cost of the module you can get anywhere in the world today. And uh, that becomes like, you know, if it, I showed you $5, whatever the previous presenter mentioned, $5 for Wi-Fi, $3 for something, $2 for something, even $1. If you take that, those are very expensive. That means all of them put together, today people pay over $20. Even if you pay $10, multiplied by $10, multiplied by 50 billion in 2020. We are talking about $500 billion. And I just want to give you a relationship of that to the entire world's semiconductors. That means everything that you can imagine all the semiconductors, your smartphone, tablet, anything that comes on your mind, all of them put together in 2007 estimate is $370 billion. That means any semiconductor chip that you can imagine in your mind, all that would cost only $370 billion. Obviously, the price point is not going to be justified. That means how do you make this convergent silicon in 2020 that is going to be sold at a price point which sustains this IoT market? In my view, we have done five of them after uh, 14 years. And next year, we'll be having more than eight. And in my view, uh, there will be very few companies, very few companies, will be less than five, who can do it at some point. But until that time, what are we doing? We'll be always, it's very nice. We have to progress. That means there will be boards with the, you know, one wireless protocol, two, or even the microcontroller alone. Those things will happen. But when eventually, when 50 billion has to happen, there won't be like, you know, uh, uh, you know hundreds of uh, chipset vendors supplying the convergent silicon. It's a very, very small set because it's very complex to do the coexistence. And we need those wireless protocols. We cannot just assume one will prevail. In fact, we would like to have that one, one to be wireless Wi-Fi, because that's where we spent uh, 14 years. So this is the need for a multi-protocol wireless. This is the, these are the few slides that I have on the product synthesis, you know, how we basically use the uh, library of components. This library of components coming from us as a uh, FCC, IC certified modules, uh, components and our partners components and the community. Because when I say single stop shop, by the way, it's not that, you know, it's not possible. We are 220 people, it's just not enough. Everybody is uh, triple booked doing our main core uh, uh, convergence uh, solutions. So when I say single stop solution, it doesn't mean that I do everybody's things. It means that I'm going to provide a solution that my partners can work along with me, but the end developer can go to market faster you know, with a spending less money and a more robust product. So here, uh, product synthesis, you give your inputs, and you uh, select the library with uh, various components. And the community also adds to the uh, library components. That is a strategy. So you complete the initial design using WSB. And uh, you select the uh, library components. We have today a 8.6 by 8.6 millimeter uh, square mill millimeter uh, module, which is uh, having M4, 512 kilobytes, and four wireless protocols on that form factor. That means typically you might have seen block diagrams saying that IoT device means you need a, a microcontroller, memory, wireless protocol, power management, sensor, these kind of things you had seen. And all of them have to be very, very tiny size. Today, except sensor, I already have in the tiniest possible in the world. 
That's the smallest you can get. Four wireless protocols, MCU, flash, all the power management in 8.6 by 8.6. And uh, we believe that is the state of the art today, but that's not basically the, uh, 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 going to cut it. It has to be a lot, lot smaller. So you can imagine when the things become so smaller with so many functionalities, the silicon technology has to be really, really expensive. And that's where not everybody will be able to do it. So that's where uh, some uh, companies will be definitely doing very well in the future. And the reason I said that we are the one who have this IoT, because I know the number one wireless company uh, does not have the chip for the M2M space. They have a chip for the mobile space. So since they do not have, I do not expect a lot of other companies to have this convergence silicon, silicon in that time space. Again, the next slide, in terms of the flow, you have Visby Think Boards. It's a library of uh, 44 uh, 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 Think Boards, which are like a pressure, pressure sensor. There's a battery thing. There is a uh, relay thing. There's going to be a uh, display thing. A lot of Think Boards will be there. So you will be taking the various Think Boards and take our platform, stack them up. If it's a low power, put a power profiler board. Write your MCU application. During the application development, use our Visby Workbench to enhance some of the development uh, process in terms of reducing the time. Are reducing the cost and use product synthesis to create your layout files and your mechanical designs and your cloud instance along with your application. And what do we really gain? Is it just the saving the time of the PCB? No, definitely not. You can spend $5,000, $10,000. What we have seen with the 3,000 customers in the last six years, every time we gave Wi-Fi, that was not even convergence, what we learned here, a, a clean Wi-Fi module, fully Wi-Fi certified. Customers were taking more close to nine months by the time these Wi-Fi module along with the software is integrated into a MCU platform. And if there's no technology involved, it's a simple software integrated to a simple microcontroller. Still, people were uh, spending nine months. It's not because they're not smart. There's a lot of small, small issues would be there. And when they go to a PCB design, then FCC doesn't pass. The performance is not the same. The antennas are different. The routing is different. There's a whole lot of things. And if you really look at they're not really, we have already solved them already in our modules then why should the designer spend another nine months? And that's where we learned in terms of coming up with this concept. It's not so much in terms of saving the money. Money saving will happen automatically by this approach. But it's really the time to market is the one today. We spend three years. By that time, a customer goes to production, and his production orders would be like something like 50,000 units after uh, three years. First year will be 10, second will be 1,500, third will be you know, whatever, uh, 50,000 is the best case. And I'm used to a more I'm a chip guy. I'm, I want to sell 1 million chips per day. And that's what you can afford to you know, really run a nice business. So here it's not going to happen. So we need to reduce the time to market. And everything that is needed to reduce, that's where we focus to innovate. Focus to innovate. One of them is product synthesis, a debugger tool for IoT, and the power profiler. Otherwise, a company like ours, a chip company, why would I spend time in designing a you know, CAD tool? It's needed because nobody's doing it. People are spending one, one year to do something, a, a very a simple thing. So here is the embedded stack. So here is the one we basically have uh, uh, two things. One is uh, you might see a lot of people communicating with uh, uh, web services outside, a, a device or a node communicating with web services. And if you want to do anything connected with a web service these days, of course, everything is well known. Everybody is expert. In fact, we don't want to say anything that we are doing something special because this is one area where there's a lot of matured you know, intellectual people there in terms of software side. But all those things are very trivial. You know, this is all there, but it's not something that we need to feel great about saying that you know, we are able to communicate with a particular web service. What happens if we really go down to the next level? All these web services are sitting somewhere else. It's free. But your device is not really that uh, uh, sophisticated to run without that intermediate proxies. I'll talk about when I, when I say about the uh, Twitter demo that we show. It's very, very uh, complex to communicate from a device to a web service without using intermediate nodes. But the moment you use the intermediate nodes, your life becomes almost you can do immediately. For example, today, you take your smartphone. You can tweet 10 seconds. Instead of a smartphone, because a very powerful uh, processor is there, powerful computing engine is there, everything you, know, you can imagine is there. If you have to take a microcontroller platform, you can still tweet, maybe in a day, but you use somebody's third-party service. Imagine that third-party service is not there. It typically takes a year to implement those firmware that is needed, secure way to do authentication inside your MCU. It takes a lot of time. So we have done all those things already in our embedded stack. When I say embedded stack, this is not the same stack as TCP, IP, everybody running, it's there. So that's why I had to put it here. Similarly, there is an embedded stack we have for physically unclonable functions. 
If you look at today, everybody gets excited in the uh, IoT devices, garage door opener, and something we do very nicely, we all get excited. And in Wi-Fi, it used to be like that 20 years ago when Wi-Fi came in. Everybody got excited because I can surf the web without connecting to a cable. And then the volume started going up, and then somebody gets into your network, then RC4 security goes to AES, WPA1, WPA2, to end up at enterprise security. So today, IoT is at the beginning. If you take the volume of all IoT, take to the whatever we expect to be in 2020, the current volume is close to zero. So that means right now you don't even have a problem. You don't even have seen a problem. What you are seeing is just entertainment. Just you open the garage, close the garage, and if your neighbor starts opening the garage, that's when you feel, think about, oh, what is happening? So all those things are very difficult to solve because the wireless, the moment you have wireless, which is the fundamental thing for the IoT to be even talked about. In 2007 and 8, we were part of the NIST white paper. Why was the IoT not uh, talked about before that? The only reason, the fundamental reason, is ubiquitous wireless. Otherwise, it's not that everybody woke up in 2008 and started making things efficient. The world was running already. Even today, it's running. It's just that we are trying to make it more efficient. So the reason why this becomes more prevalent now is the fundamental reason is the wireless has become ubiquitous. ubiquitous. And this wireless becomes ubiquitous is great, but it also comes with challenges. One of the biggest challenges is the, you, know, you don't control. If it's a wire, it means you exactly control where you can put the wire inside your office. If it's wireless, you do not control. Signals go outside your wall too. So that's where the security becomes very difficult. And today, security cannot be done with everybody says, so I have everything at my application level security. It's not that way. It has to be done every level from the start, from the beginning of the microcontroller in the trust zone all the way to the application. Right now, most of the devices you see, they don't even know these terms. That means there's a long way to go. Right now, the entire volume of the IoT is close to zero. That's why you don't have to worry. Because when the volume goes up, things happen differently. So we have created two years ago in our chipset a physically unclonable function inside the chip. That means to provide uh, a device should not be cloned, and nobody should be able to write the firmware into the device. And if you look at all the IoT devices, they're not unlike uh, smartphones. Smartphones are very complex. You just cannot design the same thing in one, two years. It takes a lot more years. Whereas IoT devices are very simple. If you open an IoT device, there's a very tiny microcontroller, some memory, some interface, SPI, UART. This is almost like a maybe not one day, but maybe a week, two weeks. There's nothing in that. It's not something that you need to worry about, a complex design. But how do you protect that one? It's your design. You made a whole product for working for a few years. The only way to protect is it has to be physically unclonable. Some authentication has to be there tied to the hardware. It cannot be say, somewhere, some token coming from somewhere else. It won't work that way. So that's what is one of the things we are very unique in this particular offering. And we have the embedded code for that inside the module. So that's why when I talk about a professional or a device maker challenges, these are the challenges that I talked in the beginning. This platform solves them from the feature set of the platform and the tools required to reduce the development cycles and the uh, cloud platform to provide the end-to-end -end, uh, solution. So here is the one. So you have a uh, uh, solution from one vendor, and it provides a secure connection to create real devices where you can uh, uh, software upgrade, has to be tied to only that particular device. In the Internet of Things, these devices are connected to the network. That means there'll be a problems. That means you sh if you want to upgrade a software, only you should be able to do. And how do you guarantee that? And when you suppose you don't guarantee that, the customer bought only 10,000, you don't have a support engineer for that. The whatever I said in the beginning, inch deep, mile wide, that is the key one in the whole IoT. That means anything you want to solve a problem, keep that in mind because it explains everything what not to do. And of course, as I mentioned, that you uh, uh, synthesize the final product uh, with uh, our VSB platform. And uh, in the demo, I just want to talk about uh, our, uh, we have 12 minutes more, so I think this should be good enough. So as far as the demo is concerned, we are showing one that tweeting with VSB. As I mentioned earlier, it's a very interesting. I don't think anybody has done it before. If you have done it, you are done with a lot of other assistants. That means you have intermediate uh, proxy server, and there is a real web service like Twitter. So Twitter is your social networking service. And we are using that social networking service. As I mentioned earlier, IoT devices, things to things, or things to people. I'm demonstrating the thing to a, the things to people service here. I'm using uh, uh, Twitter. I'm using my VSB as a thing communicating to people. That means I'm using the uh, uh, feeding option, and it uh, communicates to whoever subscribed to this particular uh, VSB underscore IoT. And uh, in the same way, the direct communication of Twitter facility we use to control. Because in IoT, monitor and control is a basic operation of doing something. 
And that's what I'm demonstrating today. And I'm demonstrating this one. People might say that what is so special about this because I can easily take my smartphone, I'm able to tweet. As I mentioned, smartphone is a very powerful computer. So that's not much to, to anybody can do that. And the next one is the microcontroller using a proxy server. Maybe one, two days, anybody can do it. Here we are able to do with just the WSB platform, all the OAuth authentication library, six months I spent to put it inside the firmware. So that's what, that is the special about this. So that means with the WSB board from here, we are communicating with a, a, a Twitter and the whole uh, technical details also have a couple of slides I still show it. And cloud-based thermostat will be demonstrating. And I'm demonstrating all these things without using any third party. That is a key thing. Otherwise, there's nothing to show this. These are very easy. You take a nice computer, you can put a temperature sensor, you can go to some cloud, you can do all the things very nicely. There's no technology as such. But how do you show that in a platform that you can really use it to produce a real device? And that's the gist of this presentation. And of course, we also have a multi-protocol demo. So here, this is a really, I think this is something that I want everybody to take it from this uh, uh, meeting because it's a very neat thing and it's very, very useful because you are able to monitor and you are able to control. So you can do some very uh, interesting uh, uh, product creation. And this is without spending any time. You don't have to go and subscribe to 100 people. No, nobody, nobody, nobody needs to be involved. So there's a sensor application, the microcontroller, OAuth client, HTTPS client, that is there inside WSB, the whatever board you are going to get that has inside. And the Twitter side, you have authentication server, and the resource server. And uh, our uh, uh, WSB board communicates with authenticate server with the embedded OAuth library that we have inside the WSB. That is a key aspect of the entire offering. And once it's authenticated, it can pull the data from there. And that when you pull the data, whatever the application that I have inside the microcontroller, that interprets and does whatever is required. So for example, we say uh, uh, WSB IoT color red. That is the message it goes to the whatever the application registered at uh, Twitter server. And this authentication and this sensor application pulls the data from there, interprets the data, and, demo and uh, controls the uh, local circuits. So you have this thing in your uh, deck there, whatever the presentation slides you are getting. And uh, this is how it works. This be communicating with the registered application so that I can pull the data and I can push the, push the data to Twitter server. And this particular de application we are demonstrating here you know, on the like, that means basically nobody is involved, just the WSB platform, a 4G hotspot, and uh, uh, the Twitter server. I have only 10, nine minutes, so what I would do is this is a BLE based, again, I wanted to show the multi-protocol wireless, that is the BLE configuring the uh, WSB. Because in a smartphone, you have a very powerful one, but here, how do I configure my WSB? I, I use a BLE, BLE smartphone for, from the BLE. And thermostat operation, I want to show that one, as well as making a phone call. This particular WSB, communicating with Filio, it makes a phone call. And it's not a big deal. You can go to and make a laptop and connect to another proxy server, you can make a phone call. But I do it without using that. That's what the whole value of the embedded stack that goes inside the WSB. And the takeaways, they're very uh, interesting ones, and they're very important ones, because uh, most of them are new. These are not something that, you know, the 175, uh, that's what one of the editor uh, told me, that there are 175 platforms today. And uh, initially, when we start the discussion, he says, why one more? At the end of the discussion, I asked them, is there anything in this you already know about, even one? And except that machine learning, which he knows, but none of them is known. That means not the existing platforms do not have these features. That means, of course, they are solving some problems. It's not that they're completely useless. So there are very interesting uh, concepts in it. You can take that one from the presentation deck that you have. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, attention. And I will want to show the demo. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Go ahead. We are demonstrating the Twitter demo now. So I have the WSB board here. And I have the smartphone connected to Twitter service. So I'm first connecting the WSB to the, the same hotspot that we have. I hope you can see it. Yes. 
Better if you subscribe to Gizbi underscore IOT, you can see on your uh, on Twitter as well. You will see that thing, the, the timestamp. What is the temperature that is uh, flashing from there, tweeting from there? Uh, I, I'll show it like this, right? So we are monitoring the temperature that is coming from the Visby board, and we can also control. Okay, so I can go and change the color of the LED of the Visby board. I don't know if you can see whatever I'm typing here, but I'll attempt. The LED color should change? Yeah, LED should change to red color. That's what I typed here, LED red. Okay. Okay. So if you look at that, uh, whatever the change there, the LED, you see the small board, that is a WSB thing board. So this particular configuration of a WSB with a tiny thing board, that is your uh, thermostat. It has a temperature and humidity sensor. And I'm using a social networking service to monitor the temperature, and I'm controlling the LED on that. And the control of the LED, I can take the same logic in my cloud, business logic, and I call in the Trilio service, and it makes a phone call. And I can switch off my HVAC. So what I'm showing here is just, you know, again, you can expand this uh, thermostat uh, in a lot more functionality. But just imagine, this is a tiny thing board, and the WSB platform, I'm able to create a product a cloud-controlled monitor device on my own WSB cloud, as well as using a social networking uh, service. And that's the uh, demonstration. And I do not use any third-party proxy server. That is the complexity of uh, firmware that embeds into the platform. If you take that complexity away, there's nothing to do. Everything is, experts are there all over. You can just do in a day time. You can use this service, that service. You can connect and show the demo. And that's where, of course, the learning happens initially, teaching. But this is what you create the real device. Okay. So now we are ready to show the Twilio demo. Right. So imagine you have a thermostat at home, and the temperature is exceeding certain any threshold you want to set. Then you want to have an automatic call coming to your phone saying your house is overheated or overcooled or you're on fire. So that's what I'm showing. So you can see the temperature over there as 85 degrees centigrade on the screen. So I'm going to the cloud app that we developed, and I'm setting a threshold. And if it exceeds the threshold, Okay, it will make a call. Which phone is this one? Okay. I don't know whether you can see this. It will come. Where is it? <laughs> it's not a huge technology as such, but there's a very uh, sophisticated uh, firmware integration is done inside the module. That's a key part of it. So that shows the uh, embedded part of our uh, software stack, whether it's a authentication library, OAuth 1.0 embedded inside, or all the stack that is required to communicate with these you know, third-party web services. That's the value of this. And it's, uh, if you want to create a device, when I say the challenges to device makers, how you solve them, you, and a single source solution. That means you take the platform, stack up whatever the thing boards that we have, and community develops, we develop. Right now, we identified 44. This particular one uses the thing board called this tiny board you see there. That is the, uh, uh, this is the board, which is a temperature and humidity sensor. I took a base board, what you are going to get it, on top of it, that's a thermostat we just demonstrated. And you can make it as sophisticated as possible, various other features. So that's the idea. So we are able to show a, 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 a the whole thing has to, product has to be created, in my view, without leave, leaving the desk, including your layout, your bomb, your uh, uh, cloud instance. And we are not there yet, but that's how I look at it. The only reason why we are doing is not to really reduce the money of the, you know, the tool vendors. No, that's not the intent. In fact, the tool vendors are my partners. We are going to enhance more tools. That means we are going to make more money anyway. The reason is I don't want somebody to spend one year when there's no real engineering is done. 
I already have solved the problems of the software, already solved the problems of layouts of the board, RF. Why should somebody spend another one year just to integrate the board and spin one more board? We are going from that side. So that's what is a single source uh, solution means. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have a few minutes to, I think a very few minutes, so I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hi, this is Gary. I'm with the organizing committee for Hot Chips, and we're really excited to announce today that we're giving away, uh, Zigbee has, uh, I'm sorry, Red Pine is giving away their Wisby IoT dev kits, 100 of them. So we're going to put up a slide showing who the winners are. You'll have to look at your badges and locate the number at the middle bottom of the uh, badge. And if your uh, badge numbers are from between, I believe it's 108 to 207, then you are a winner of the 100, uh, one of the 100 of kits. And we'd like to ask you at the break, just after the Q&A, that you come to the back where the volunteers at the registration desk will give you your kit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now for the Q&A. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So do we have any questions? Anyone? Uh, so I sure. have one. Sure. Uh, so you've uh, <clears throat> determined that there's these 44 thing boards, thing boards that, that need to be done. Do you see that uh, eventually you would start integrating more of those into the main chip, uh, you know, as, as you start to sure. get more sure. uh, transistors available or, you know, for the same size, or, or are there are certain things that sure. it makes sense to keep them separate. Yeah. yeah, so very good question. So basically, we studied today all the market segments of IoT to our best of our abilities and identified things like, you know, uh, uh, pressure sensor, uh, magnetometer, and things like that battery relay. And those things, I do not see them integrating into a silicon. When I said in the beginning, uh, uh, microcontroller, uh, power management, wireless memory uh, sensor is going to be integrated at some level of integration, not necessarily at the you know, 28 nanometer or 40 nanometer silicon node. But uh, definitely certain things which are possible to integrate, they will go. But I always see this whatever thing interface and enhanced set of these library components, because we do not know what somebody is going to come up with tomorrow's sensor which might not be a silicon, uh, CMOS silicon based. So there will be some things will integrate, but I see more on the wireless side and other functionality getting integrated. But obviously microcontroller memory, we're integrating today, except the sensor. Today I already integrated REST, but sensors are very difficult to do because they're very uh, different nature. Yeah, because yeah. you're, you're dealing with the analog yeah. or whatever. Exactly, yeah. So, okay, uh, so any other, any questions? I don't see anyone out there. Okay, uh, so. Can we thank uh, Ben Cat uh, again? And uh, I think we'll have a break until uh, or it starts at 3:30. I think it's some break, so we'll have a break and be back here at, at 3:40. Okay. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. So our next speaker is Andreas Olafsson. He's the CEO and founder of Adaptiva. Uh, since its inception, Adaptiva, uh, as a semiconductor company, has achieved two world firsts. Uh, it's the first to build a microprocessor with 50 gigaflops per watt uh, processing efficiency, and it was also the first to successfully crowdfund uh, a chip. So please welcome Andreas Olsen. Hi. Um, so I don't need to introduce myself then. Um, so uh, since I'm a founder and entrepreneur, um, I'm always selling. So uh, if you see me selling too much, just tell me to stop. But I'm going to try to, uh, to talk about, uh, give this like a tutorial um, to uh, talk about software-defined radio, which is a very exciting uh, uh, new concept. Uh, not so new, but exciting things that you should know about. So first of all, what is software-defined radio? Um, so the Wireless Innovation Forum defined it as a radio in which some or all parts of the Physical layer functions are software-defined. Um, and so not, like, uh, not unlike software-defined networking, um, the idea is, like uh, Mark Andreessen would say, the software is eating the world. Um, you want to take everything out of the analog domain and put it in the digital domain. And as soon as you've done that, you want to make it into software. Um, and so if you can imagine your old FM uh, radio receivers or AM radio receivers or really any modem, 
there was a lot of analog stuff on there. Uh, and today, uh, most of it's done in software in digital. Um, but I think the definition is, is far too uh, narrow, really, right? The truth is it's much more interesting than that. Uh, it's not just radio. It's the whole EM spectrum. Uh, whether you're talking about microwave, even up into the, the visual domain, the idea is that you have, you know, have something transmitting, you have something receiving. And if you can sample it with a data converter, if you can transmit it uh, through a DAC, uh, you can do some amazing things if you can do it in software. So think platforms instead of having a single uh, hardware platform for every spectrum. So, um, so this is kind of the canonical software-defined radio architecture. Uh, you would have an antenna right, receiving the signal. Uh, you would have an RF front end um, do some, possibly some down conversion. Uh, you have a, a DAC ADC. After that, it's all digital, right? It's all bits. And then the question becomes, how do you want to process those bits? Do you want to have an ASIC that does one modem, so it's not really software defined? Maybe you make that ASIC programmable, so then you can maybe say it's firmware programmable. Um, do you want to use an FPGA, right? Do you want to write Verilog code or VHDL code and synthesize the, uh, uh, the modem or the hardware data path uh, into the FPGA? I would call that software defined. Um, do you want to use a, a microprocessor, right? Like an Intel or a, um, an ARM microprocessor? Um, do you want to use a DSP from TI or analog devices? You got a ton of choices uh, of architectures um, and, and technologies. But the, the, the end outcome is, is always the same. You're, You've now sampled the signal, uh, you have the raw data, uh, now you get into the mathematical domain, digital signal processing, um, and uh, you have choices. Um, so if you look at why it's so cool, um, it's really about cost uh, and time to market. Uh, and um, if you take an, an analog modem, an analog wireless uh, platform, um, by the time, uh, and, and um, and the previous speaker also mentioned this, right? By the time you get a modem into the market uh, and get it to work, you might be talking about six months to nine months. You're tweaking the RF performance. Um, you are possibly doing multiple spins of a board. Um, and, and the time there is, you know, nine months time constant. Uh, compare that to a platform that maybe already has the RF built in, wideband, that you can choose uh, which, um, uh, which frequency and which bandwidth you want to sample. Um, and uh, you're doing everything in software, right? So you write your little C code, you press the compile button, you've got a new binary in minutes, you load that into your device, voila, right? Now you're seeing, uh, you're seeing a signal uh, versus the month time scale that you would usually have for a hardware platform. So that, this is pretty revolutionary, right? Um, now, what if you could bring it down even further? What if instead of minutes, you could have real-time adaptive communication, um, cognitive radio? where you would actually jump around the whole spectrum, look for available bandwidth, uh, try to avoid uh, noise congestion. Um, this is pretty cool. So SDR, uh, just like pretty much anything with S, S in it, right? SDN is, uh, is, is really uh, pretty disruptive. So um, I like this slide. This is, uh, I think, from some NIST or something like that. Uh, it shows how much the spectrum is cut up, right? So this is your opportunity slide, right? Imagine doing a modem for each one of these little colored boxes. Um, this should all be software, right? So have an uh, infinite bandwidth data converter um, or a few separate ones uh, and start, start doing a software. That's, that's the premise. And spectrum is limited, right? We only have so much spectrum. Uh, you can only go from DC to, uh, to the available electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so uh, some, some ideas that people have, have, uh, uh, have used this for, uh, I mean, clearly in, in the commercial space, right, whether you're talking about uh, Wi-Fi and LTE or GSM or UMTS or whatever, there's some part of software defined in there, right? Uh, there's too, too many standards. Uh, too many people couldn't agree on one communication standards that the, the Qualcomm's of the world and everybody else they need to bring programmability in, right? Uh, so that's there, but that's the commercial side. Um, here I'm more talking about everything else, right? Not the smartphone, not the Wi-Fi, but the low volume opportunities, right? Uh, things that for whatever reason, because of cost, 
have had to drag along these very expensive proprietary legacy solutions for decades, whether it be military or um, some kind of infrastructure like uh, emergency transponders, um, because there was no choice. Well, with software defined radio, you can actually rip up a lot of that stuff uh, very inexpensively and do it all in software. Um, so, um, some examples uh, amateur radio, clearly, you can do it all in digital. Uh, radio astronomy, um, you wouldn't think of that as a radio, but it is ENM spectrum. Um, and so the idea is that you would have, you want to look at, a, at the sky. You want to take in signals from the sky, and um, uh, you have huge antennas to collect that data. Uh, you have to synchronize between the data. You have to correlate between it uh, to get a very, very faint and tiny signal out of a lot of noise. Um, this is all DSP stuff, uh, and it's using, again, EM spectrum, so I call it software-defined. Um, and then towards the end there, um, teaching DSP. So uh, when, I, when I was uh, taking DSP classes in, in, um, in uh, undergrad, um, I didn't like it very much. I'm more of a builded kind of a person. And for me at least, and I think for a lot of people who are builded kind of people, seeing it working really makes it click and, and stay with you. So the idea of having um, you know, kind of software-defined radio as a teaching tool for DSP, I think is quite powerful. Uh, oh, and uh, by the way, that picture is of a satellite tracking system uh, that somebody it won the Hackaday Prize, uh, where um, you, um, yeah, they, they, they made it possible to track satellites across the sky. Um, so um, SDR challenges, uh, it's always been about size, weight, and power, and performance. Um, if you have, you know, and cost, of course, right? If you had enough money and enough size, you can pretty much build anything. Um, but thanks to Moore's Law and all the miniaturization, uh, we started making things a lot smaller. Uh, but whatever you're doing, uh, if you're doing embedded design, you're always going to run up against that envelope. You, you want it to be battery operated to make it interesting. Uh, that means you're power constrained. Um, so that device up there is a DVB uh, receiver for satellite. And it's, cell, it's called RTL-SDR. Uh, and it's one of, the, one of those hacker revolutions, right? $25. Anybody can get it. Completely, somebody has reverse engineer and hacked a driver for it. Um, and this was a commercial device, right? A very, very low cost that somebody turned into a RTL, uh, sorry, an, an SDR transceiver. Uh, I should say receiver. Um, and again, $25 for something that 10, 15 years ago might have cost $20,000. Um, so uh, people are using this for many good things and some not so good things. Um, So um, now this is kind of what, what uh, one of the things I've done in the last few years. Um, in 2012, we launched this ball, board called Parallela uh, on Kickstarter. Uh, we raised almost a million dollars. And uh, the idea behind the board was to democratize access to parallel computing for anybody doing parallel computing research. So the academics, right? Until that point, we had tried to sell uh, our eval systems with the SDK under NDA for $10,000. Why? Because that's what everybody had been doing, right? Uh, and so we did it as well. It wasn't working for us, so uh, this was what came out of it. And uh, inspiration was taken from guys like Arduino, Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone. Um, the idea was that you bring the cost down enough, now you can give it to everybody, you build an ecosystem, build a community, and um, you go from there. Um, and, um, and as a startup company, it was, it was a bit novel. Uh, I don't think anybody had done that in the chip industry until that point. But um, so yeah, so we started with parallel computing, uh, but that's not what I'm talking about today because we, we found out that there was real value in this platform for uh, other things like robotics, imaging, and software-defined radio. Um, but if you look, take, zoom out, right? What you see here is kind of a Raspberry Pi on, on steroids, right? It's got the, the main processor, which is a, a dual-core ARM uh, Xilinx device with programmable logic called the Zinc. Uh, it's got our 16-core. DSP, which I'll talk more about. Uh, it's got gigabit Ethernet, so you get a decent de data stream, and the USB, HDMI, and all that other stuff. So you can use this as a standalone computer, or you can use it as an, an embedded device. Um, so, um, of course, you know most people here are chip designers, I, I assume. But um, um, so today, the performance, 30 gigaflops, gigabyte of RAM. It's pretty vanilla. Uh, you get down to 28 nanometer. 
Uh, these are not incredible specs, but let's consider where we came from, right? This is 2015. You can now get this board for $99, something that probably would have cost $10,000 10 years ago, um, and it's completely open, right? No NDAs, completely accessible, download the data sheets, uh, drivers, software. You know, once you pay $99, the only thing you need to pay is your time to build something with it. Um, um, in terms of, you know, again, uh, this is not the Raspberry Pi, this is not the BeagleBone. This is really meant for embedded uh, processing with, with massive amounts of data coming into it from some kind of sensor. So um, with that respect, we made these connectors on there, not very hackable connectors, right? You, you can't really solder to these tiny ones, but you can bring in a ton, a ton of data. So we got uh, 48 uh, uh, GPIO signals or 25, 24 LVDS pairs uh, for hooking up to things like high-speed DACs, ADCs, RFICs. Um, but we also made a little porcupine board for, for people who, who do want to hook up to it with, with jumper wires. By the way, I'm, I'm curious, how many people in these, this room know how to solder? With a show of hands. Yes! <laughs> All right. So that was, uh, that was very good news because uh, um, I found that uh, even, like, even in the chip industry, the people I've worked with, very few of them actually knew how to solder. So th I'm happy that it's still a skill that's around. Um, so, um, so this is the SDR platform that one of our customer, one of our base station customers, built for themselves to evaluate a um, kind of a combination of the parallel board and a um, um, an ADI board called uh, FComs, right? So FComs is a is really kind of taking the general purpose SDR world by storm uh, because of the specs, because of the availability, and um, I'll get to more of the specs. But in a rough rough part, you can sample anything between 70 megahertz and 60 gigahertz with a 50 megahertz bandwidth, settable by software. So imagine, you know, as a, as a DSP guy working in MATLAB or something, you say, wow, you mean I can just, you know, give me the bandwidth and I'll do whatever I, I want there? Within, within reason. Um, and uh, so the, our customer was actually working with a, uh, not the chip I was showing there, but a 64 core chip that we did, um, but quite successful. Um, um, so yeah, so this is the uh, this is a 9361 from analog devices. Um, it's a, a, a two by two transceiver. Um, like I said, 70 megahertz to six gigahertz, um, 12 bit DACs and ADCs. Um, and uh, you know, there's a reason why this is so popular um, within the government, within academic research, companies like uh, National Instruments, Edis Research. Um, I think you know the availability. Uh, and performance together is the key here. And it is eye-opening when you start playing with it. Um, so, but this is not the first time people have done SDR. Um, so I would say the, the government, especially DARPA and so forth, were doing big um, SDR projects in the 1990s um, for, you know, with, with big systems. Um, and things that really haven't changed, right? You, you need the RF front end. Uh, you almost always need an FPGA in there um, to, if, not, if nothing else, to hook everything up, but also generally to do the front-end processing at, at the smaller bit widths. Um, you really want a CPU in there, because if you have to program everything in bare metal C code, um, your project will run longer than the lifetime of the chip, uh, and that doesn't work. So you need, a, you need an OS in there, right? So that's where the CPU comes in. Uh, so the CPU will run some high-level operating system, like, you know, like in a... Linux flavor like uh, uh, Ubuntu or Debian or whatever. Um, and, and then I think a lot of people want to have a DSP in there. Uh, DSP meaning something that is tuned for signal processing. And that's what we built. And so what we proposed here was you need four components to make an SDR system. You need a, an RF component, clearly. You need a CPU for the Linux. You need FPGA for, for everything in between. But you also need a DSP that is C programmable. Uh, and very efficient, because you do need to get to that swap uh, point, the size, weight, and power. Um, and so, yeah, so we have here, starting off on the, uh, on the lower right there, is the uh, RF signal coming in, goes through a mixer, uh, a data converter, goes through a connector, FMC, it's a FPGA mezzanine card connector, um, and then goes on to um, the FPGA, which is the lower, lower side here, uh, with some filtering, 
Um, and then it comes into uh, an AXI interface inside the, the Xilinx chip. And from there, it goes into memory. And once it's in memory, now it's truly software, right? Anybody should be able to pick it up. And just give me a pointer, tell me where the data is, and I'll take care of it. So for those who haven't, haven't used uh, the Xilinx Zinc or haven't heard of it, um, um, I would just, I'd be surprised if, if people ha haven't heard of it. But um, yes, I'm a, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan. We've been using this for over three years now. And uh, um, the, where I think they, they really did something right was they put the ARM processor, you know, the CPU front and center. I love the fact that I can boot into a regular Linux system, never having turned on the FPGA and be up and running. Right? So I boot it like a normal processor. And then the FPGA is, of course, crucial, instrumental, but I do that later. I don't have to bootstrap two things at the same time, um, which was generally the case in, in the old way of doing processors inside FPGAs. Uh, so we have this, this ARM subsystem with a lot of hard-coded blocks in there, like a memory controller, USB interface, Ethernet, and then you have this AXI bus um, inside AXI, AXI interconnect um, that hooks up to the programmable logic. Uh, and there, that's our sandbox. We can do anything there. We can, uh, and there's a bunch of I.O. going out to that programmable logic. So now we can hook up any interface, any converter, any motor, uh, just by writing a little Verilog code. And uh, we can also accelerate certain functions, if that's efficient, like let's say you have a turbi or a turbo or something like that. And uh, in our case, we can then hook up into the memory map of the ARM processor through the I.O. So we've become a shared memory coprocessor. So very, very effective communication. Um, and uh, um, it's, um, it's a wonderful device. Big fan. So um, now this is, the, this is the architecture that I came up in, in 2008. Um, so uh, it's a, a 2D array of risk processors. Uh, and uh, so it's MIMD, right, not SIMD. So every processor is a standalone unit that can, that can run an operating system. It's not really meant to run an operating system, but it certainly could. Um, it's meant to you know, really crunch on signal processing code. Um, and all these cores are connected with a 2D mesh um, and very fast network on chip. Um, and all the networks and all the clocking, there's not a single global interconnect in the whole chip. So you know, potentially this architecture could scale to infinity in terms of, of you know, it's, it's just putting down a tile. Um, and that's worked very well for us. We've done four chips. The last one we did was a 28 nanometer um, and worked out of the box. We did the whole chip with three engineers in 12 weeks. And so the idea of modular design, tile-based design, it's, um, it's magic. Um, so, but, but this architecture we came up with in 2008, um, it's uh, from the beginning it was C programmable, and then later we added layers for MPI, OpenCL, Open, uh, OpenMP, um, and I think, you know, I would say that the 50 gigafloss per watt in 28 nanometer is number one still, even though we did this chip in 2011. Um, this is one of our chips. This is the, uh, uh, the third version. This is 65 nanometer technology, so ancient stuff, you know, 10 years old. Um, but uh, uh, we did this one in 2010, um, and it's got 16 1 gigahertz RISC processors uh, on the chip, uh, about half a megabyte of memory. And this is the chip that we, in, we used. This was the uh, shuttle version of the chip that we used on the, on the parallel board. Um, and... Uh, um, yeah, those are the specs, right? I think that um, some cool things about the specs, it's got north, east, west, south links on them, so you can actually use the chips to tile them together into massive arrays of, of, of chips on a board. Um, the memory bandwidth, 512 gigabytes per second of, of me local memory bandwidth. Um, this is what makes it possible to really get the performance through. Uh, and um, as long as you can get the data into the chip, the challenge has been to get the data into the chip quickly enough. Um, so, this RISC processor, I, um, sometimes I call it a DSP, sometimes I call it a CPU, um, but it's something that we came up with from scratch, and there were two reasons for that in 2008. One, I didn't have the money to take a license from ARM, because I was poor, and uh, two, uh, I really felt there was a need for a DSP that was modern. Um, I used to work at Analog Devices, uh, uh, designing the Tiger Shark DSP, uh, which was this very, very big VLIW type DSP, uh, with an enormous instruction set, uh, but it was very, very big. And, uh, and one of the units that uh, I worked on, the floating point unit, was less than 3% of the, of the silicon area, um, probably closer to 1%. And uh, um, it, um, 
um, it felt like a big waste. Like, isn't the floating point unit the point of having the DSP in the first place? Uh, why, are you wait, why are you throwing away 99% of the area to other stuff uh, just to support that DSP function? And um, so this was an attempt to make a DSP that where the floating point unit was there front and center, and everything that was added to that was overhead. Um, and if you look at the history of DSP in the 1980s, it, it grew up as a Mac unit, right? The first thing that came in was a multiply accumulate, and everything just kind of evolved from that. But from 80s to 90s, year over year, if you discount the process improvement, it, it kind of got less efficient every year in a sense, if, if, you, if what you want to do was a Mac. Um, and so we this went back and said, what we want to focus on is doing multiply accumulates. Uh, anything that's not in it, multiply accumulate goes out of the chip. Um, that's the instruction set. It's probably one of the smallest risk instruction sets that there is. Um, uh, and, uh, but surprisingly enough, uh, the compiler performance is still quite good um, and uh, somewhat counterintuitive. Um, so uh, we did uh, GC the GCC compiler port, and uh, um, I say that um, if you're writing C code, um, that's all you need. Uh, you don't need much more than that. Um, the, the memory system, 32-bit um, architecture with, with addressing, and uh, I think that the most um, controversial decision here was um, a shared flat address space, so no caches. Um, and uh, this has been both a problem and an advantage, right? The f we would never have gotten the 50 gigaflops for what's sustained if we put in caches. So that's, that's a good thing. The bad thing is, do people really need 50 gigaflops for what? Turns out a lot of people don't. So there we lost, because what they care about is ease of use. And there we definitely lost, because caches are really good for programmers. Um, but for the, some customers that must have the 50 gigaflops for watt and actually have very hard real-time requirements, um, like some of the wireless communication customers, they don't mind the, the, the flat um, address map and the scratch pad memory. They know, they know how to move data around. Uh, they know how to use messages. Uh, and so for them, it was, uh, it was definitely a big win. Um, so... Um, Third bullet from the top, um, instead of having a cache, we have a four-bank memory system. So each, each core has 32 kilobytes of, of local memory uh, on these early chips, uh, split into four banks. So you can do a, a fetch uh, of instruction, fetch of data, um, and, uh, and data communication between the cores on the chip at the same time. Um, so four simultaneous reads or writes. Um, and the memory ordering um, is very loose between cores, uh, the network has split read and writes, so we can't guarantee read and write order, um, um, but locally it's strict ordering. Uh, the network on chip, uh, we have uh, three meshes, one for on-chip writes, which is the, the fast one, the one that we really want to make go fast. Uh, read request is a so totally different uh, network, um, and that's done to, provide, uh, to avoid deadlocks. Off-chip writes, um, because the off-chip I.O. is so slow, uh, tend to get in the way of the on-chip writes. So we had a, a separate network for that. Um, but uh, the, the network itself is, is quite simple and maybe also a little bit counterintuitive uh, if you read the books. Uh, you would think in a macro network that um, um, you need to uh, optimize efficiency. You don't want to send redundant address bits on every clock cycle. Um, and uh, so on-chip wires are pretty much free. So we decided, you know what? From a complexity standpoint, it's way easy to send everything on, this, on every clock cycle. Um, and that's what we did. We sent 104 bits on every clock cycle. 64 bits data, 32 bits address, 8 bits of control. And so the efficiency is decent, uh, not outstanding, it's not 100%, but the simplicity is wonderful, right? From a designer standpoint, nothing easier than sending one transaction per clock cycle um, and not having to work, work uh, to uh, worry about things like buffers and virtual channels and everything else. Um, this was uh, uh, quite easy to design, um, and it scales fairly well. Uh, routing is uh, XY, so you know, no adaptive routing, just static. Router on, uh, along a, a row first, and then a, a column until you get a match, and uh, go inside a, ch uh, a core. Um, so uh, a little bit about the, uh, the, the software involved. Um, so these are some packages that, that we use. Uh, 
not all of them open source, but generally all free. Uh, GNU Radio uh, is a project that came out of, uh, I believe, MIT and with government funding. And uh, it's a, um, a Python-based um, software-defined radio platform. Lots of blocks, lots of people working on it, where you as a developer can go and plug and play. Um, uh, I mean, plug in blocks and route them, and um, um, it's, it's going gangbusters right now. They're just right now, there's a conference that I had to miss because I was coming here in Washington with uh, about new radio. Um, we have our Epiphany SDK, like any chip processor company, uh, with a compiler, debugger, standard libraries, um, and uh, of course, Vivado tools from Xilinx. If you want to program the Xilinx Zinc FPGA, you need those tools. Um, there are free versions of those. Um, Copper Threads is a software company that builds open source tools for OpenCL, MPI, and coprocessor threads. Um, OpenMP, uh, there was a, once we started the, uh, the parallel board, we got 200 universities uh, who started doing research uh, around the parallel. And one of those groups was a, a university in Greece that did a port of the OpenMP compiler for us, or not for us, for their own purpose, but we have access to it, and everybody else does as well. Uh, so we, we can now treat the Epiphany uh, code processor as an Epiphany, as an OpenMP 4.0 device. Um, and the last one that we started um, a, um, a few months ago was this uh, uh, PAL, maybe bad acronym, but a Parallel Architecture Library. And so um, what, I, what I found was that uh, there really wasn't a DSP library that I could access. If you take things like um, uh, MathLib, math.h, um, it's a scaler, and it's really tuned towards a large CPU. I needed something really small that was, had some kind of parallelism built in. Well, there are libraries like that, but they're all proprietary. There really isn't an open source one that fit our needs. So we started our own. But as a small company, we can't afford to do all the programming on our own, because again, we don't get any money for these. We get a couple of cents or a couple of dollars for selling our chips. So uh, we try to kind of crowdsource it. Um, and uh, we did it all open source, Apache license, and then we gave away a free board for every function that somebody wrote, right? So basically, the slogan was, write a C function, write a, get a free parallel board. And it worked. So we got uh, something like 35 collaborators uh, within the span of six weeks. Um, and uh, so that's, that's ongoing, but going quite well. Uh, so I'll get, try to get down to some more concrete details uh, instead of just selling and marketing. <laughs> and um, so um, first thing, um, um, you have to create a, an SD card, right? So the, the way the platform works is uh, um, you have an SD card slot which uh, has the operating system that you, you use to boot the device. Uh, so uh, the boot process for the, for the Zinc, there are multiple different options. The one that we chose was you have a small flash on the board that boots up something called U-Boot. From U-Boot, it, uh, it jumps to a location on the SD card and takes the, uh, um, the uh, operating system image from there. And then, you know, of course, the root file system, everything else. So, uh, but to make things easy, you say, look, we have an image, the img.gz, and uh, we just burn that using, this is Linux commands, right? Burn that onto the SD card that we have plugged into our laptop, take it out of the laptop, put into the uh, 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 single board computer, parallel, and power on. And there you go. There, your computer is booting. So the reason I'm putting up these commands here is I just want to kind of show a little bit of um, how easy it is, right? Easy or not, but the idea is you, even if you don't understand the commands, you can copy them out and, and do it. Um, um, you will also download Vivado if you want to use, uh, if you want to program the FPGA. Um, a couple of gotchas, I'm not going to go through this, but um, uh, these are things that I had to do to get it to work on the, uh, on the Ubuntu machine. Um, um, and then you get into dependencies, and there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, there's a punchline at the end here, but uh, um, the, you install all the dependencies, right? So the magic command is sudo apt-get minus y install, and then a bunch of programs, and it's just going to download them and install them. Um, I'm sorry if I'm, th these things are obvious. Uh, I just don't know if the audience is Windows-based or Linux or Ubuntu, so... Um, so um, now the, the radio chip we're using is from Analog Devices, and they've done an outstanding job open sourcing a lot of their software and uh, firmware and, F and Verilog design for their board, which is very smart on their part. Uh, 
makes it the support burden much less uh, uh, for some very clever. So that we found that there's there's multiple audiences in, in inside our community. There is the audience that as long as they have access to the information, they can do pretty much anything. And I mean, they're worth gold because they'll they're your beta customers that kind of work inside your team. But what they cannot deal with is if you don't give them information, right? That's just a, a hard wall for them. Um, so for them, having something like the open source here is fantastic. And then you have, of course, the people who don't have the time. That's a huge other part of the audience. They need everything packaged, right? That for them, you need a an image that you burn to an SD card, or maybe a ready SD card that people can buy online. Uh, but you kind of need both of them. So uh, for us as partners and for for some hackers. The fact that analog devices put up everything online for, for downloading is huge and quite good wiki pages and tutorials. Um, so, um, and, then, um, and then you get through building this thing, right? And um, ADI has good instructions um, and uh, you go through them and they work, right? Um, what we actually found with the parallel board was this 10 step procedure is too much for most people. So we, when we had the, uh, uh, for about a year, we had a, an SD card creation process that had about um, five steps in them. And uh, you know, a certain percent of the people got tripped up because it was too many. Five is too many. It needs to be one. Um, and so I think the, the lesson was you, have to, you, you cannot make it too simple. Uh, the right number of steps is really one. Um, so that's what we did. At the end of the day, uh, and this is a link, uh, so um, I will... Uh, I'll make this available online for anybody who wants to download it, but uh, um, and it's, it's open source. But the, uh, yeah, there will be a link that you can download the whole image for, so you don't have to follow all those steps. That's just kind of more for your, um, for your knowledge, right? The sources need to be, the open source needs to be there to back up the binary images. It's not one or the other, it's, it's really both. That's my, my conclusion. Um, and same thing here, links to some of the uh, ADI devices that, that really drives our development. We're just, we're not the SDR experts. I design microprocessors, but uh, we were able to, uh, to ramp up thanks to the fact that they did that. Um, so I'm gonna try to show a demo. Let's uh, see if this works. Um, so let's first see if, yep. So, um, so this, this right here um, is a, oh, clever, don't touch the demo. Um, that's the, the radio head, adapter board, and the parallel underneath there, right? So it's kind of a sandwich. Not the most, um, not the smallest platform, but there are you know, probably thousands of these FCOMs boards in the field, so having an adapter board works quite well. And this is a, um, a little cluster we put together with parallel boards. Um, so um, let's see if I managed to not crash the system while I was doing that.
So I'm going to move on to the next demo while that one is uh, rebooting. Um, the demo is fine. I shouldn't have touched it, right? If it's not broken, don't touch it. That's the lesson here. Um, so um, So how many people here write C code? OK, so not just Harvest. Some people know how to, uh, here I know how to program. So, um, so I just wanted to show you. Um, this, is, this was done by, um, I'll frame it a little bit. Um, so um, this was done by one of our community members for Parallel or for, for SDR, um, a very talented guy from Belgium called Sylvan, uh, named Sylvan. Uh, and uh, so um, he built his own SDR platform, um, not this one, but a, a separate one uh, based on a, on a, a Lime microchip. And uh, uh, he needed a fast FFT. Now, unfortunately, we did not have a fast FFT to give him. We'd worked with the company before. We decided not to, to make their FFT available, so we didn't have one. Uh, but he wrote his own. Um, and so that's one of the beauty, again, of, of openness and collaboration. Uh, here is this partner that we're not paying any money to, and yet he's doing work for us in the community for free, and outstanding work at that. Uh, so um, so he, took, he started off with an FFT, FFTW on the RMA9 running on the Zinc device, and he got uh, uh, 200 megaflops of performance. Um, he tuned the compiler using the Neon. He boosted that by about 2x. Um, and, and then he uh, ran on the Epiphany, Epiphany performance. On one, again, this is one of the Epiphany cores, right? There's 16 on there. Um, and uh, this is running at 600 megahertz per core. Um, and, um, and then he said, you know, he's not scared of programming assembly. Uh, so he did an assembly part of it. Most of the routine was in C. The, the key butterfly kernel was done in assembly. And he gets. I know, 660 megaflops, right? So on a tiny DSP core that burns um, you know, on the order of 20 milliwatts, right? He's getting more performance than a, a pretty beefy A9. Um, and so, um, so th these are his results. And uh, I just want to show you the, um, uh, the code as well. Just uh, don't be scared. It's just a couple of minutes. Um, and so, um, so the idea here is the... Um, um, the, the ARM processor will send data uh, and a program to the Epiphany, right? So the ARM is the master, the Epiphany is the slave. And uh, the Epiphany, um, the code is C code, right? Even though it's a coprocessor, it's, it's your, your regular um, vanilla C code. Um, and with, for, for all that is worth, right? If you don't like C, then you won't like this. But if you like C, you flew right at home. And actually, what we found was that um, over the last seven years, uh, selling this concept of a C programmable, massively parallel processor, um, the ones that already liked parallelism uh, and knew how to deal with it and liked C coding, well, we got along with them. The people who had moved on from C to something else, a higher level of abstraction, whether that be you know, JavaScript or uh, Hadoop or something else, um, we could never get back to them, right? Because uh, software moves forward. It never moves backwards. And so if, we'd, if, if we didn't catch the people before they moved over, uh, we we're going to lose them. So, um, but the, you know, people are, who do like us, C code is fine. And then on the, on the right-hand side there, you see the assembly routine that he wrote. Um, the fact that you have 64 registers uh, makes assembly programming trivial because um, uh, you can you don't have to rename a lot of things you don't have to be um, besides optimizing the pipeline and the algorithm and everything else you don't have to optimize registers right so there's only two or three knobs to, to tune rather than four um, so uh, so that's um, that's programming the epiphany at the, at the base layer right I mentioned OpenCL MPI OpenMP that would sit on top of the C code um, but at the base level it's a C programmable risk processor not unlike any one of the ones that you you know. Um, so that's the uh, um, that's the last demo. Let's go back to um, to the first one. See what's going on.
So, um, embarrassing, and I have to apologize, but um, I'll, uh, I'll try to debug this offline. Uh, anybody who wants to come by outside on the table, I'll, I'll give you a private demo. Um, what I wanted to show off here was uh, um, basically a spectrum analyzer um, and uh, uh, sampling the uh, RF converter. Somehow, when I, uh, when I touched it over there, I broke the signal. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, the, um, but the, the idea here is um, you have a platform that is um, extremely high performance, uh, 60 gigahertz to 70 megahertz, um, all open source software as well as hardware, uh, very accessible. And uh, um, yeah, software defined radio, uh, if you haven't tried it yet, um, anyone get started, um, start with this or take one of the inexpensive RTL SDRs for $25. Um, and start playing with new radio. Um, it is quite magical once you start seeing the signals, and even more so if you uh, uh, if you can transmit something. Right? Um, it's uh, there's um, there's a lot of momentum in this space right now, and I would uh, I would definitely recommend trying it out. Do we have any uh, questions for Andres? Okay. Uh, well, I, oh. I guess I have a question. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so you said that once you have the developers move past C, they, they never want to go back uh, to programming in C. Yeah. So what you're saying is I should force my students to learn C and oh, yeah. let them see other higher levels of abstraction? <laughs> maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe they can know both, right? Uh, that would be a good thing. But um, um, there, there, there needs to be an abstraction above C, that's for sure. But there, there will always be people programming in C. Uh, and uh, it just will maybe be more of a, um, more of a niche um, and um, so that they are the they become more of the tool makers for other people to use. That, that's my view. Uh, but, um, but I was kind of more referring to uh, companies even, right? That, that would just say, you know, they kind of say, oh, see, we don't want to touch that, right? But, yeah. but there was a big problem also that we, initially we were only C programmable and we could not find students or anybody who could program our device. I mean, I mean what do you teach in high school? You teach Java, you don't teach C. And so uh, we had to, uh, we brought in some grad students who did internships, and we had to teach them how to program in C, which was not very good for a startup company. So that didn't. So we, yeah, C is definitely a scarce uh, quantity right now. Yeah. We're we're sticking with it at yeah. <laughs> David still. So we have a question. Yes, could you address the uh, frequency roadmap? Like one of your slides said, we can do up to six gigahertz today, and I was wondering when do you think you can do ten gigahertz and you know, would we ever get to 25 and all that kind of stuff? For the RF? Yes. Uh, that's kind of outside of my domain, to be honest with you. Uh, that's, that's, that's a question to ask analog devices or TI or one of the, you know, 60 gig guys. But, um, um, I mean, yeah, the people have been doing, people have been looking at 60 gig for a while, right? So it's not... Well, so I was looking at it from a, this is about, you know, Internet of Things and amateur... Pro developers and all that kind of stuff. And usually, you know, if they can do 60 gigahertz today, add so many generations of IC, and then, you know, guys like us can do 60 gigahertz at home. So I was wondering, when do you think you can you have any idea about what that frequency roadmap looks like? So, um, I mean, what, what, what I do know is, you know, you're talking about devices or the actual physics of the communication? Uh, we're talking about demos that work. Um, so, so what we're looking at is like, you know, today you have a little box and that box is good to six gigahertz and you can see the TV band 
and one of your early slides was said, this is the frequency space is busy, right? And the nice thing about software-defined radio is that you can make it a receiver for anything in, in those bands, right? So right now you stop at about six gigahertz. So at what point can we go to 10, right? And, and, and if you don't know the roadmap, it's not really your thing, I'd accept that answer too. But I was just thinking that, you know, you're, you have plenty of memory space left in your little parallel uh, co-processor, and that sort of implies you have room for additional signal processing, and you have high hopes for what that processor could do. And all of that would come true if you had faster uh, or better bandwidth off your RF signal. Um. Yeah, so I, I mean, my view is there, is there will be interesting things happening, and there have been interesting things happening. Standards take a long time to materialize, right? Wi-Fi didn't happen overnight. Um, the, 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 the cellular guys are moving on kind of five to eight year increments, right? So 5G will be interesting in terms of global deployment. And if you're talking about a mass number of consumer devices, then 5G will be interesting for the high frequency stuff. That's my view. If today, yeah, it's, uh, you can probably do it with, you know, you put together data converters and you put some uh, mini circuits, mixers on there, you know, you can probably put something together at home. Um, but I'm not sure what, if you're looking for packaged devices that you can just do it in software, yeah, um, you can probably do it today with, at, at, at a certain price point. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, we have a question over here. Yeah, uh, Chris Rowan of Cadence. Um, there are two classical objections to software-defined radio. One of them is energy efficiency. You know, a leading-edge uh, radio standard takes hundreds of billions to trillions of ops per watt to be competitive for mobile devices. And the second is... Um, uh, interoperability and certification. That is, you have to get everyone in the world to agree that your modem is doing the right thing. What is the role for maker radio in that world which is so energy obsessed that uh, so processors are challenged and so standards obsessed that you can do anything you want so long as you're willing to wait five years to get everybody to agree that it's okay for you to go live? So I, I'm, I don't think the makers are going to help the Qualcomms and Ericsons and the Huawei's of the world design the 5G. I think that's not going to happen. But uh, um, there's, I, I see it as a bit of a democratization of spectrum and knowledge here that if you don't want to be the most aggressive things, if you don't know, you need to go into a smartphone, um, because of Moore's, Moore's law and everything else, because of better algorithms, you get to good enough that you know you can you can run today if you can run a, a one gigahertz processor at 25 milliwatts um you know what that's a fair amount of processing and it may be good enough for your needs uh for doing a software defined radio for a certain application um especially if you don't transmit all the time um so i i think the interesting one i mean there's another concept of the maker movement the long tail right is um there are many, many applications out there, very, very small, whether it's, uh, you know, 100 units or 1,000 units that can't afford for something like Qualcomm or, or Ericsson to go after, but they're still worthwhile. They add value if we implement them, and um, that's where SDR really shines, I think. And that's where the kind of the, the make, I'm not going to call it maker, but the hobbyist and do-yourself guys uh, can add value, like guys like Sylvan, right, who, in fact, uh, reverse engineered the SGSM protocol and was able to um, listen to people's phone calls. He's, he's a good guy. He's a white hat. But uh, that's, that's the kind of thing you can do. Or the guys who did the RTL-SDR, that little device I showed, the $25 device. These are guys who have day jobs. And on their side, they decide that they're going to do an open source RTL-SDR driver so people can actually use it for something else. Uh, and so they are the first layer. And then they had that off to the, the idea guys who say, Oh wait! If there is a an open source driver in a twenty five dollar device, I'm going to put this little device on my anything, right? Put it at you know for doing climate con uh, um, research or uh, animal research or anything else, right? I mean, the 
kind of the ideas are endless as long as you have those components in place. Um, so yes, again, rambling a little bit, but I don't think the makers and the Qualcomm's and the Ericsson fit together. It's more the, the makers and all the little applications that Qualcomm and Ericsson don't care about. I think that's it. So uh, I'd like to thank Andres for uh, coming to speak today. Uh, and so uh, our next speaker, final speaker, is uh, Faresh uh, Favsar. Uh, he's a segment marketing manager for IoT at ARM. Uh, but he has an extensive engineering uh, background in embedded systems and cloud uh, services. Uh, he developed many core uh, technologies at Apple and worked on various R&D projects at Qualcomm uh, before uh, moving to ARM. So uh, please welcome for our guest. Hello, everyone. I'm going to use uh, one more machine here to check my notes. Well, hi. So looks like I'm the last guy you had to deal with before wine and cheese. So I'll try to be quick. Um, so I'm part of uh, the segment marketing group at ARM. And uh, I look at kind of the ecosystem and uh, what's happening within the IoT space and try to feed this back into um, what, what ARM should do and what uh, our partners should do. So let me see if this works. Yes. Um, so, of course, uh, we have heard a lot of products and uh, uh, folks today that uh, talk about ARM. And I uh, just wanted to clarify that we work with a lot of these semiconductor companies. We don't build our own chips. Um, we license our technology and uh, kind of uh, work with the uh, silicon vendors and OEMs and uh, try to get uh, understanding of their uh, markets and then uh, feedback that back into our loop to improve the technology that we work with. Uh, just give a, a snapshot of what this looks like is just over the last year, we shipped over 12 billion chips. And this is... Uh, across the board from uh, infrastructure work, mobile, uh, automotive, a lot of sensors, radios. And if you look at what's happening within this, uh, so we have three categories of products. There is Cortex-A, Cortex-R, and Cortex-M. Uh, they all kind of target different, different markets. Cortex-A is your typical uh, application processor, so to say. Uh, Cortex-R is the class of devices that target the um, uh, kind of uh, real-time required uh, safety-critical type of uh, uh, use cases, while Cortex-M is the more of the traditional low-power MCU class uh, devices. But we see more and more use cases where these gadgets, these products, they are not low-power or constrained devices anymore. They are like really high um, Impedance. They're like really high uh, output devices, which are uh, used in uh, so many different use cases. We'll, we'll go through a little bit of that. So if you look at what Cortex-M has been doing, uh, over the last year itself, it was more than 4 billion devices. And this is just trending up and up. Um, as I said, like it goes into different uh, MCUs, radios, sensors. and Looking at what's happening in the actual end consumer space, you look at Kickstarter today, and there are like tons of products uh, that people are just getting creative with. So Kickstarter see th sees this as a trend, and they came to us and are like, OK, there is like so much ARM stuff out there. Uh, we, this should be cu curated. Uh, so we have a curated page at kickstarter.com slash ARM where a lot of these gadgets that are um, ARM-based, they are, they are featured over, over here. And looking deeper into this, you will see uh, there are pioneering stuff in wearables and uh, home automation and uh, personal care and things like that uh, that are happening uh, in the maker's, maker community. And what, 
what these guys are doing. And what, what's happening is um, these Kickstarter projects, they are not like small uh, initiatives or anything. If you, so we looked at all the Kickstarter projects that have been funded so far, and it, it comes um, uh, close to like $50 million of funding uh, just on ARM-based processors, uh, products. Uh, a similar, uh, similar thing we'll see uh, on the Cortex-A side, uh, pioneering stuff in uh, virtual reality, uh, home gateways, navigation, and uh, a lot more. So we, of course, heard about uh, a lot of the community stuff happening around Arduino and Raspberry Pi. There is uh, a, a really neat thing happening um, with Raspberry Pi. They are, they are creating a new uh, platform called AstroPy. Uh, so the astronauts, uh, um, there are some astronauts who are, who are working with the students in uh, kind of uh, uh, attracting them on to, the, to the, this new platform of space data and uh, kind of uh, uh, creating projects around how you can take a Raspberry Pi box and uh, fly to the moon, or not moon, rather, sorry, a flight to ISS. Um, and they're going to collect all this data on ISS, and they're going to bring it back uh, and distribute it to uh, the students to do more research on. So th this kind of stuff is uh, almost unheard of, because like, you know how uh, kind of our space programs, they are not open platforms to uh, uh, students or to makers or you know, uh, for us to kind of uh, experiment with. So uh, kind of taking a step back, there is a tremendous amount of uh, variety and the kind of applications that we see uh, that all our semiconductor partners are uh, coming out with. And uh, not just there is a, a lot of choice in uh, the hardware platforms, but there is so much software um, software availability and uh, the, the interest in uh, kind of pushing for ARM support uh, has been tremendous. And I'm just showing a real snapshot of uh, this here. Uh, I should add uh, Windows as well uh, down on the slide. So kind of uh, bringing this into uh, Internet of Things and the sort of the elephant in the room. Uh, I like this picture of uh, um, what this tradition story is about, how uh, blind men try to describe what an elephant is. And depending on who you talk to, you'll, you'll get this kind of uh, reaction, oh, IoT is all about the sensors, IoT is all about connectivity, IoT is all about big data, it's, it's all about M2M, and you know, there is, there's no kind of, uh, one answer to this. It is, there is, everyone has their own uh, take on this. And I think over the next few years, we'll see um, a lot of this is going to be true. Uh, but how, how do we uh, make progress on it? And how do we uh, make sure that we, that we reach there uh, is, is the kind of uh, important question. I like a description from um, Harvard Business Review around this is um, they talk about kind of uh, looking at this in four steps, uh, where you will start off with um, monitoring, have uh, control, add optimizations on it, um, and then eventually reach a point of automation where all your systems and the system of systems start uh, working autonomously. And if you, if you uh, listen to Mark Andreessen these days, he's going to talk about the next wave of uh, uh, things happening is around optimizations, and um, you'll see uh, uh, there are many areas, uh, many verticals who, who are entering that that space. Uh, but also, there are just uh, a lot of uh, verticals still in the monitoring and control phase. Like, like traditionally, uh, they have just been in that in that space from um, from the legacy protocols and whatnot, and they are they are now ready to kind of enter uh, either control or optimization phases. Uh, to give you, give you like a concrete exa example of this, uh, you can take Nest as kind of something that has gone through the entire flow here, and uh, it has basically found a way to autonomously uh, control your uh, temperature and thermostats. So I want to go quickly over uh, some of the hardware trends uh, first, and then I'm, I'm going to... Um, talk a little bit about software, but 
I wanted to keep some more time towards the end for questions, and I can uh, ans answer some specifics around this. Uh, a lot of this stuff might be um, something that you already understand, and uh, you know, uh, you don't, you don't. Uh, it's not news, but I just like to kind of connect the dots in you know, showing how complexity and performance in mobile devices, how they are kind of uh, entering all these other markets, and how that is enabling a new push for uh, high-performance stuff uh, happening towards the edge and uh, to all these devices. So we all understand, you know, mobile devices these days have tons of sensors, a uh, lot of compute, a lot of uh, 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 interfaces for the users to, uh, to interact with. And uh, this has happened over such a short period of time. It's just amazing how uh, uh, this, this has come around. But now what's happening is all these uh, activities or uh, interactions that you used to have with just a single device, they are now uh, getting expanded into uh, devices of their own. Uh, and this accessorizing of uh, your devices where uh, certain things around uh, physical activity with a wearable or just a display of uh, notifications and interactivity with uh, a, a different type of device or you know, uh, um, pictures and cameras uh, from a different type of device. And you see a trend in um, consumers uh, getting more and more of these devices in their, in their life, and it's it becoming a norm. So going a little bit deeper um, on the wearables, you see there is a whole range of um, wearables that um, enhance uh, these experiences, whether you have uh, a deeply embedded experience from uh, what you put on your shoes or your clothes uh, to certain things uh, uh, that are like really rich experiences around uh, uh, headsets and um, uh, virtual reality. So when we, when we look at problems around um, how how to define the variable space, and we can kind of many times come across, okay, hey, uh, this processor is going to solve the variables problem, or that uh, software is going to variables problem. It's not really uh, one size fits all. There is there is, there is so much uh, range uh, that you you have to think about. So taking this further, uh, of course, we all understand there are like. A lot of things happening in the home space, and there are um, so many use cases around the home space that are going to get into that control and optimization phase. Uh, today, you have like a, a few of these use cases coming online, and most of it is driven by uh, security and uh, uh, convenience and comfort, and how you can do a lot of this remotely. Uh, you'll see as the, some of these technologies become um, more accessible, uh, the work around standards and the work around ecosystems uh, get normalized, you, you'll see uh, more adoption of these things uh, uh, going forward. So um, we came across a, a report uh, that uh, these days, in, in a typical home of uh, two adults, two kids, you, you have uh, more than between 15 to 20 ARM-based devices. Uh, in a single home. And what we see going forward is you will see almost uh, uh, 50 devices uh, in every home uh, in the next few years, which is, which is a huge uptake. So after home, you um, kind of look at um, the connected car and uh, the uh, the whole uh, driving experience problem. Uh, whether whether you believe the self-driving car will happen in the next couple of years or a decade, it is it is uh, something that people are looking at seriously. There are a lot of tests that show that it is possible, and uh, you begin with you know uh, things that happen just within within the vehicle system, how uh, these systems interact with the driver how these uh, systems interact with other vehicles. Um, and there are um, 
many protocols, standards also playing, playing in this space uh, that, are, that are driving um, more and more sensors in a single uh, car uh, versus, uh, and along with compute uh, in, a, in a single car versus uh, kind of, they're, they're, it's not a, a mechanical system anymore. There is uh, a ton of uh, electronics happening in the background. So I, I like this chart about how uh, automotive architectures have progressed. Uh, like in, in the 90s, it used to be everything is uh, modular, and uh, of late, things are mo moving towards more of centralized control, uh, fusion of a lot of the sensors and uh, control units, and uh, going forward, vision and uh, connectivity to the cloud uh, starts becoming uh, very, very important. And as you can imagine, this is something uh, that's going to require a lot of compute just happening uh, on board on these devices. And, um, and, and these systems need to be ready for that. So uh, three of these, uh, I wanted to highlight three of them here. Uh, the whole idea of sensor fusion, where um, sensor data from all the different uh, subsystems are kind of coming together to uh, kind of bring a much better understanding of what is happening in the vehicle itself and surrounding the vehicle, uh, along with communication with other vehicles as well. Um, there's a whole idea of contextual uh, awareness uh, around the driver. Uh, like today, you have just like uh, maybe two settings for two drivers, but like just to understand who is driving the car, what are the driving habits, how how your vehicle can adapt to what. Um, uh, what what you like to do uh, when you are in the car. So in many ways, your car becomes this um, advanced gateway uh, platform where um, so much of data is kind of uh, coming together where you're going to um, have uh, firmware. Like, these things are not new, right? Tesla has, like, firmware updates, and your car kind of just... Uh, uh, can do more things that you might have an app store going down the line. I don't know. Um, so the neat thing about this is uh, a, a lot of these initiatives um, have been kind of uh, makers and uh, hobbyists have been playing around with this for a while. Like it's not something that is just happening in pure R&D labs or um, uh, only only for high tech. Uh, car companies or things like that. Uh, folks who want to get uh, their older cars on these systems, they are able to kind of uh, uh, use uh, community boards like Raspberry Pi or BeagleBoard or things like that and kind of put these systems together uh, and just run with it. So I wanted to um, shift gears and go into a little bit of commercial uh, domains, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a few uh, problem spaces. Uh, to begin with, uh, looking at retail and just display tags. Uh, and the, the space here, there are um, many different use cases of how um, you know, display, displays have morphed over time. And uh, typically, when you talk about um, uh, you solving a display problem, you would kind of think about oh, advertisement boards or uh, you know uh, menu locations or you know, things like that. Uh, but now these things are going all the way to uh, the shelf displays and even um, tags on your clothes and things like that, where you can have a system where you all the way from uh, a central uh, central office, you can control uh, uh, instances in different uh, geographic locations that, hey, uh, I want some percent of sale going on in California versus in New York. And uh, you're able to do this remotely sitting in one central office. You can uh, control all the displays uh, all the way ac across to the actual device. So what happens is you would have um, each uh, retail store talking to the cloud via, via the standard backend. But these retail stores now have specialized gateways that would um, talk the low frequency uh, RF um, uh, protocols that will talk to like uh, battery powered or sometimes uh, energy harvested devices. Uh, 
that can that can be the interaction point for the customers. So going forward into the uh, retail uh, space and how the uh, interactions happen with the with the geolocations and um, uh, and kind of the point point of contact in a way. Uh, there are many different platforms looking at uh, Bluetooth beacons, um, whether they make it, some are taking the angle of making it very, very easy for developers to interface with it. Uh, some are bringing their you know, radio technologies and making it so that you don't have to uh, worry about configuration so much. Uh, think about, like, so Bluetooth beacons started with you know, uh, small examples of how you can uh, interfa interact with uh, things in a store. Uh, but, but once you have uh, some proof of concept, uh, just as a typical uh, case is, uh, there are a lot of challenges once these are actually deployed. Like if um, there are stadiums that would try to uh, deploy Bluetooth beacons to kind of enhance the uh, you know uh, in-game experience as well as like how uh, the shopping experience happens while you are at the game and things like that. And those guys work at scale, right? They, you have like all, uh, more than 2,000 beacons in a single stadium, and uh, you run into the problems of uh, managing these beacons. How how are these beacons uh, uh, interacting from a, from a radio point of view? Once you have a deployment model for a single st stadium or a single store, uh, how easy it is to kind of replicate that across uh, tens of stadiums or thousands of stores. That that's that, those are some, some of the problems that uh, these guys are looking at as, like, okay, beacons are great. Um, it's improving uh, customer engagement. It's improving uh, the sell-throughs and whatnot. Uh, but how do we take uh, the, deployment down, uh, the deployment cycle from a week or a month to a few days? And how do we kind of train our uh, employees around kind of managing these and kind of when the batteries go dead, like, what happens? So those are like some of the practical uh, problems that uh, you are running into now. Um, so um, just just as a kind of example of that, uh, um, one of the leading uh, uh, kind of brands in, in clothing, they started um, automating their uh, inventory management uh, from all the way to the factory to all the way to the store um, and. Uh, so what happens is they would track what is happening in the factory, how it reaches different different store locations, and what happens when customers buy it, and how they interacted with with social media and all that. Uh, so they put in place this entire uh, model in place. Um, for the first ten stores, they were able to do that in the in the, you know a few months. But to get the entire fleet of over a thousand stores online with this new system, uh, it took them almost two years. Um, which, which is uh, pr pretty uh, daunting for, for more adoption. <clears throat> so you can take the same kind of examples around um, what you are seeing in home, what you're seeing in, in customer experiences, and uh, take them into examples around hospitality or entertainment. Uh, so you can imagine, like, if a single home is going to have uh, 50 devices um, per family, uh, a single hotel uh, floor uh, is going to have probably uh, more than 250 or something. Uh, and thus, like, you have in a multi-story place, you have so much of data um, uh, generation happening that you need more uh, compute and uh, data processing abilities closer to the edge uh, and uh, some of these standards to uh, kind of work together across all these ecosystems. So I'll just touch upon uh, one example of uh, the industrial use case where Airbus, which, is, uh, which has been uh, you know, incorporating tracking and monitoring uh, using RFID, uh, they have, uh, they, 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 so they work with uh, national instruments and uh, they basically track and visualize the entire production uh, flow in real time uh, using Cortex-A uh, based uh, SBCs. And 
what's amazing is it's, uh, the entire uh, so the entire uh, assembly floor they had like uh, half a half a million uh, touch points where um, these airport uh, these airplane parts uh, go through and uh, uh, they were able to collect uh, much more data what's happening with these and like how to optimize uh, the entire workflow so um, these are systems today and we uh, kind of see and we can kind of foresee like what what is going to happen uh, in some of these there are uh, a lot of platforms where um, People are looking at the next point of differentiation. I would like to just take an example of uh, uh, Teradeep, where they were looking at bringing uh, visual understanding or scene understanding implemented on hardware. So they have like a neural network where uh, the entire thing gets implemented in hardware, and you get uh, results of uh, what what this uh, what the view of the camera is, and uh, kind of uh, other other aspects of the of the vision uh, implemented within hardware. So you'll see um, as uh, the compute requirements uh, go higher and higher uh, in these platforms, you're going to start seeing such specialized uh, uh, implementations around um, whether it's just FPGAs or then these FPGAs kind of resulting into actual blocks and uh, uh, hardware pieces. So we touched upon a little bit of uh, this long tail in the, in the last uh, talk, where uh, typically you see uh, all the mobile devices in the millions and billions be being sold. But all the makers and the Kickstarters and the hobbies, and they're, they're still in that phase of kind of thousands or tens of thousands. And uh, one of them, or some of them, are going to kind of uh, break out and have that uh, kind of a steep curve. But you are still going to have a lot of these uh, um, use cases being served in this long tail type of a, a model, where you're not going to have millions of uh, uh, devices being sold, but there are going to be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these devices, which are still going to be an important part of the overall puzzle. Uh, so it, it, it's something. Uh, interesting in this phase of the industry right now where um, there is a lot of activity and a lot of uh, enthusiasm around uh, this long tail, but just to see like what can push out of this and uh, go into the um, towards the end of the curve there. So I'd like to highlight one other uh, trend in this in this space, uh, which is like okay, uh, we have seen how mobile devices became their own ecosystems and platforms, and they have their own own app stores, and there are a lot of people that can make money out of it. So a lot of these new hardware platforms are kind of checking out that model now, whether. Uh, it's uh, video or virtual, rea virtual reality and whatnot. Like there are these new hardware platforms, they are becoming the new kind of gold rush where uh, they are going to push how much more you can do on the platform, how much uh, compute you can uh, get out of these at the same time, kind of enabling many new use cases uh, on a single hardware platform, uh, which, is, which is super exciting. So I want to switch gears again and uh, go into the software space a little bit. And you know, typically, you, you see, uh, you guys understand like overall like the whole software space about like you know there are uh, different bootloaders, different architectures, different operating systems, and all that. Um, all these guys talking to the cloud and enabling uh, you know big data and analytics and all that. But I wanted to highlight one of the key aspects that sometimes gets overlooked or um, just is not understood very well is around uh, security. Uh, as we enter the, the phase of uh, interacting with the physical space and interacting with actual devices that control and optimize and auto, uh, 
automate uh, things around us, uh, security becomes a super critical problem. And uh, with security is tied the problem of privacy. Um, uh, I've just put a few examples of uh, uh, what has happened with uh, just uh, payments and hacking and uh, whatnot. And these things, uh, they have reached all the way to the board meetings now. Um, but this has real impact on uh, actual people with uh, IoT or new uh, new devices uh, coming in. This is going to be more and more critical. And uh, as you guys think about new hardware platforms or you know new architectures and whatnot, uh, this is something you should really really uh, consider highly. So over the, over the last few decades, this, this is a kind of summary of some of the trend that we are seeing, right? Um, in the late 90s, it was all about embedded systems and kind of working with the devices and kind of getting your device drivers and getting uh, your software to work on specific devices and whatnot. Um, the kind of developers that would address that uh, were of different skill set versus what you see today is uh, the, all, all the rush about being a platform. Uh, so it's like uh, you 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 got to address uh, how your how your platform is uh, accessible via APIs, how your um, how you uh, make sure you have some SDK so that you can bring more developers uh, to your uh, to your platforms, and. Um, Part of what is happening because of this is uh, there, there is the point of uh, uh, kind of some might call friction, but at the same, same time kind of convergence is uh, all these cloud developers in a way are entering the embedded world space. And they are looking at uh, what they have been used to in terms of development. They have been kind of, OK, I'll do a git push, and it'll be up uploaded or deployed in my data center within a few milliseconds, and the whole thing will kind of come about. and um, my new service is going to be online and available to everyone in the world. Uh, Why well, in the embedded space, you don't have that. Uh, you, you are going to have so many moving, uh, moving parts that just because some things work on a system or a set of systems, uh, how are you going to kind of uh, test all the different use cases? How are you going to make sure uh, the firmware update that you're going to make goes all the way to the end uh, and things like that. There, were, there was actually an example around uh, a home gateway platform called Wink uh, that had some issue with the, uh, with the certificate management or whatnot. And when they issued a firmware update, all the uh, home automation gateways that they had deployed in the field basically went dead. Uh, and they, I can't imagine like what scramble they went through uh, to get it back all online. Uh, but so these are now kind of the uh, problems of the new era that we are uh, now part of. Um, in terms of you know software technologies and all that, um, pretty sure you guys understand this very well. Like there are a whole lot of uh, uh, things available on ARM. Uh, there are uh, they are addressing you know uh, things from compute to radio to sensors. But what I, I'd like to highlight uh, the work that is happening with Linaro. Uh, and uh, if, any one of you, if any of you guys are looking at Linaro or considering becoming a member, I really encourage you to uh, look at this uh, more seriously. Because the work happening within Linaro um, gets pushed across the entire ecosystem, whether uh, it's uh, mobile and going into Android, or uh, they work with um, Kind of the the home segment and uh, also the the server server guys and enable all the um, the big data stuff happening uh, or kind of all the different all the different uh, software blocks that are important to run on software uh, on servers sorry um, these guys are enabling them uh, to happen on on ARM so this is really uh, a key piece uh, to the uh, to the success happening uh, with. Uh, all these different types of uh, uh, use cases that we talk about. Uh, so this happens with um, many members, uh, many companies uh, that are coming uh, come together as members uh, on Linaro, and then 
they contribute engineers and resources uh, to uh, make sure that these, pro these projects keep moving forward. And I really encourage you to be part of uh, Linaro if you guys are working with uh, all these uh, software components. <clears throat> so we talk about um, kind of IoT and end-to-end -end connectivity uh, and things like that. So uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what ARM is doing, uh, which is a new initiative called ARM Embed. Um, the Embed project has been around uh, for almost five, six years now. Uh, what, what they did is uh, for Cortex-M class devices, uh, they basically uh, had, had an architecture design which allows for abstraction of all the um, hardware blocks via SIMSYS. And with SIMSYS, uh, they are able to kind of uh, have a, a software interface uh, where with embed, you can basically have a, a device operating system uh, that, can, uh, that can discover your hardware blocks using SIMSYS, and then you talk to uh, different cloud services um, using however uh, many, many ways you, can, you choose to. So typically, if you look at kind of the IoT space, you have all these devices which are generating the little, the little data, as we call it. Um, they either have direct connectivity to the cloud via cellular or other, uh, uh, other radios. Uh, you could have a smartphone that enables you to be, uh, like your smartphone is almost like a gateway with all these different radios within it for wearables or um, headsets or you know, thermometers or things like that. Or you have uh, a gateway that uh, takes you uh, from all these different uh, radios and standards and protocols, and then doing all the data scrubbing locally uh, before uh, this thing hits the cloud. So there are a lot of, lot of standards that come into play. Um, and as uh, some previous members, uh, presenters talked about, uh, a lot of this is not available for free. And uh, you know, there is a lot of um, time that goes into just putting these things together. So, what ARM has done is um, kind of um, bring, uh, bring an ecosystem view to this, where we, we will provide a free and open source uh, operating system. It's, like, it's, it's a bare metal operating system. It's not a, a Linux clone or a variant or anything. Uh, this is something that goes on Cortex-M class uh, MCUs. So it's an open source operating system that would uh, come with all the software blocks that are required for uh, security, for uh, all the different radio protocols, uh, the device drivers. We work with a lot of the partners um, and uh, enable the whole idea of um, device management all the way from the device to the cloud. So we provide the... Uh, embed OS uh, to, to many of the uh, developers and enable, enable that ecosystem. And on the cloud side, uh, we are developing a, a service that would have the, uh, a, a, a rather a server that would have um, the capability to do provisioning, uh, device management, and end-to-end -end, uh, security around this. So the neat thing about this is we are doing this in a typical ARM way where uh, we are working with the entire ecosystem on this. So on the hardware side, we are working with a lot of hardware partners in um, kind of making sure uh, the, the Cortex-M-based uh, products that they are make, making will be embed compliant and uh, they can enable and access uh, this an ecosystem of new developers. Uh, we are working with a lot of the ecosystem partners who uh, kind of help the vendors and the end customers in uh, bridging the gap between having a hardware solution and kind of having the entire uh, problem solved. Uh, so these ecosystem vendors, they work with uh, the hardware guys as well as the, uh, the cloud providers. So just an as an example, um, like IBM has uh, a, a kit that uh, you can hook it up um, with uh, an embed-enabled 
uh, board, and within five minutes, the entire, um, all the sensors and all the kind of uh, pieces come online on their Bluemix platform. Uh, so if you are like an enterprise uh, app developer, you now have uh, a new uh, class of devices that you can start playing with uh, because of all this enablement in the ecosystem. So this has this had tremendous traction. This was announced um, last October. Uh, we have more than 135. Uh, I think it's close to 150 now. Uh, thousand developers, um, and more than 100 uh, boards that enable uh, this kind of a, this kind of a solution. So um, kind of in summary, I just wanted to. Um, Kind of highlight the fact that with with this uh, with the advancement in mobile, uh, there has been uh, a shift in what we expect uh, out of our gadgets and out of our uh, tiny devices. Uh, the trend keeps keeps growing uh, with a lot of a lot of the makers and uh, kind of creative uses of uh, community boards like Arduino and uh, Raspberry Pi, Beagle boards, and things like that. Uh, the amount of uh, compute and the, uh, the kind of complexity uh, is now achievable for the kind of uh, things we uh, see in, uh, in, aut auto um, in automatic cars or like self-driving cars or uh, factory floors or uh, you know, new age uh, entertainment systems or things like that. Um, there, are, there, are, there has been a lot of progress made, but there is still a uh, lot more to do as we kind of start addressing the long tail of things. Um, so look forward to working with you guys uh, on all of this. Thank you. Uh, I think we have plenty of time for questions. Are there any questions? Yeah, you know, the question is uh, uh, regarding embed. Uh, how uh, would you articulate the differentiation between embed and the embedded Linux? Yeah, sure. So uh, typically, embedded Linux is something you would run on a Cortex A class device. So um, as I said earlier, there are three classes of products that ARM comes out with. Uh, ARM has a Cortex A class device, which has um, its own uh, kind of ability to do the uh, paging and management, memory management, things, things like that. So Cortex-A uh, class devices that you see in like mobile devices these days, they are uh, Linux capable in a way, uh, while the MCU class devices, which is the Cortex-M, um, is not, uh, is not a, a, a Linux capable system. Um, so although it is a 32-bit system, it is not going to run Linux. So that's one of the things that um, Embed addresses, because there is a lot of fragmentation in this space where uh, you have uh, individual companies providing like individual blocks, but you have to um, put these blocks together as a product developer to get, it, get an entire solution. So what ARM is doing is providing all these blocks um, and providing them for free and open source, it's almost like having an Android for IoT where you can now uh, deploy these sensors or MCU class devices. I, I hate to use sensors as an example because as you saw in the uh, slide from Kickstarter, there are, there are too many use cases which are enabled by Cortex-M, like a wearable or um, uh, like a smart pet tracker or something. Um, so going back to the question, Cortex-A is the Linux-capable system, versus Cortex-M is not. So Embed OS addresses that problem. Does that answer your question? Uh, sort of. I, I was wondering, uh, 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 would you envision that uh, one day I could have a uh, multi-core chip, uh, assuming all ARM cores of different uh, kinds, uh -huh. while uh, in, Embed and Linux, I mean, they just uh, turn out to be a, a part of the middleware running on different cores. Yeah, and yeah, very much. It's, it's possible. In fact, um, 
I see use cases or like uh, different partners looking at this where you would have a dual core uh, cortex A with a single cortex M or uh, multiple cortex M of different sizes. And you know, uh, there are already uh, those kind of activities, like uh, they're targeting different use cases, uh, but you know, a Linux enabled uh, Cortex A device uh, works with a Cortex M, which is an embed OS type of device. Um, so take, for example, variable, right? A variable is something where you want, uh, for, a, for, for a use case where you have a high compute uh, or like a user experience type of uh, problem, then you have Cortex A as a requirement, but at the same time you want to uh, target a low power usage uh, type of a model, and so you can have uh, some of the ambient processing happening on a Cortex M, and then that can wake up the other guy when, once it's ready. So there are SOC designs which are kind of uh, implementing both on the same core and things like that. Thank you. Yeah, sure. We have any more questions? I guess I won't keep you from the one and cheese then. Uh, thank you. For, yeah, thank you. Uh, for speaking. Uh, so.